Good afternoon. Welcome to the 1 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the May 22nd, 2018 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for the closed session. I'd now like to ask the City Clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Matthews? Here. Chase? Here. Brown? Here. Noroyan? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Terrasa? Here. Before we open public comment, I have a brief announcement. The city attorney will provide a report on items listed on the closed session agenda at the beginning of the 2 p.m. or 2.30 p.m. session. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to the closed session agenda? Seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting to the courtyard conference room where the council will go into its closed session. I'd now like to ask the city clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Present. Matthews? Here. Chase? Here. Brown? Here. Noroyan? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Terrazas? Here. And if the clerk would also please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point in the agenda, it's uh, an honor to introduce new employees to the city. So I'd like to first invite up the Director of Libraries, Susan Nemitz. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing Goretti Gallardo. She's joining us as permanent staff at the Aptos Library, where she'll be working as a library assistant too. Um, we have the pleasure of the many skills she got at UCLA, um, where she got her baccalaureate, baccalaureate degree in um, art history. So she has a strong background in art history, museums, and now libraries. So we're very happy to have her on board. Hey, Thank welcome. You. And next up is Director of Planning, Lee Butler. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Tess Fitzgerald to you all. We've had uh, several uh, people from our administrative team depart recently and Tess is filling uh, in for an administrative assistant to departure that we had. She is a resident of Santa Cruz County uh, since 1987 and currently resides in uh, Boulder Creek. She began her career in government at the Superior Court of Santa Cruz in 1997 and then served as the clerk board of supervisors, clerk of the board of supervisors for seven years. She loves attending public meetings so much in her spare time. She has served as a member of the Boulder Creek Recreation and Park District Board of Directors and uh, she's been there since 2006. She's also a fan of local special districts where she serves as the uh, special projects administrator for the Boulder Creek Fire and Protection District and helps successfully pass measure in to get a parcel tax for emergency response equipment replacement with an 84% voter approval in 2016. She says that she recently came out of semi-retirement so that the three teenagers that she has ages 13, 14, and 17 in her home could learn how to operate a washing machine and oven before they graduate. <laughs> Please welcome Tess. Good luck. Great Thank you. All right, welcome. So our first, we have, we're now gonna move on to uh, next uh, segment of our uh, agenda and that's uh, for a few presentations. So our first presentation is a proclamation recognizing Public Works Week and I'd like to now call up Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Directors of Director of Public Works, and this is the one week where we take time to recognize the employees of public works departments in cities and counties across the nation, to thank them for their efforts to keep our water clean, our traffic moving safely, providing alternative transportation ways to get around our city, like walking and biking, including bike share, and making our trash disappear, usually without 
the residents or businesses or visit visitors having to think about it. These are the employees that pick up and process or recycling yard waste and garbage you put out on the curb each week, or the employees that clean the water you send down the drain. These are the employees that repair the street, fill the potholes, sweep the street, and thanks to SB1 gas tax increase, we have more funding for local road improvements. These are also the employees that work with our contractors to make sure construction happens in a safe manner and minimizes the impacts to the public. And these are also the employees that are improving our transportation system for pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicle travel. As part of the Public Works Week in the city of Santa Cruz, we are offering free public tours of the resource recovery facility and our wastewater treatment facility, all in the comfort of the city trolley. Um, the tours start at 12 noon and will be available today through Thursday, departing from the corner of Lincoln and Cedar Street on a first come first serve basis. There's more information on the city website at cityofsantacruz.com. I'm very pleased to work with an award-winning public works department that continues to win awards for the quality of the projects in our facilities and the quality of our staff. And at this point, I'd like to invite Josh uh, Spangard, one of our senior civil engineers, who's also a local APWA board member. If you'd like to make a little presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. I'm Joshua Spangard, senior civil engineer, public works. But I'm, as Mark said, I'm here before you today uh, as a member of the board for the APWA Monterey Bay chapter, just here to thank you for your proclamation and recognizing Public Works Week. Uh, this year, we have actually 24 agencies recognizing Public Works Week through proclamations, which is 10 more than last year. And I would like to present a poster, the traditional poster, Public Works Week poster, but this is just a loner. We had so many new agencies that we'll get you a real one soon enough. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. In honor of Public Works Week, I'd like to just read a portion of this because there were so many accomplishments that Public Works staff has done. But this uh, mayor's proclamation is um, um, really kind of recognizes staff. So let me just begin by saying Public Works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Santa Cruz. These infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, supervisors, and employees from state and local governments and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protection, protecting our nation's pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle transportation systems, solid waste systems, wastewater systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. The City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department has been frequently recognized as a regional leader in innovative and forward-thinking projects and services, including active transportation projects, infrastructure projects, wastewater treatment and reuse, solid waste practices, alternative fuel vehicles, energy efficiency projects, and sustainability projects. Now, therefore, I, David Tarasas, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through, the 20, uh, through 27th as National Public Works Week in the City of Santa Cruz and urge all citizens to join with the dedicated employees of our Public Works Department here in Santa Cruz in activities and events celebrating the important projects and daily services of public works professionals and to recognize the substantial contributions that they make to protecting our health, safety, and quality of life. <laughs> I, I just want to say the staff that we that I have is just incredible. So you are very lucky to have such qualified staff to to carry on and do such an amazing job and I'm so proud of them. So thank you. Great. It's National uh, Public Works Week, and there's no better time to present two awards to our public uh, work staff at this time. First, I am proud to say that the American Public Works Association, Monterey Bay Chapter, has awarded its 2018 Public Works Person of the Year Award to our very own Assistant Public Works Director and City Engineer, Chris Schneider. <laughs> Chris, if you please come up to the podium. I'm looking, is there him? 
Chris's infrastructure accomplishments began in 1987, 30 years ago. He and his engineering staff have been responsible for hundreds of major City of Santa Cruz improvements. I wish we could name them all. Highlights include the Arana Gulch Bridge and multi-use trail project, the retrofitting and replacement of our bridges, the construction of Depot Park, the renovation of the historic City Hall, the San Lorenzo River Bike Pedestrian Bridge and Highway 1 underpass path, various bike lanes, cycle track, erosion control and traffic signal projects, the Wharf and Depot Park roundabouts, three refuse cells and stormwater bypass tunnels at the resource recovery facility, the front Soquel and Locust Cedar downtown parking structures, the secondary treatment upgrade of the wastewater treatment facility, and recently the Branson of Forty Creek bicycle ped bridge and multi-use trail project. I think I might've said them all right then. <laughs> Uh, um, Chris, the community is enriched by your work over three decades. I am so honored to present you with this award, and I'd like to go up there and present it to you in person. Thank you. We've carved out some time if Chris would like to speak. <laughs> David said I could have as long as I want, but uh, oh, no. <laughs> we're in trouble. I don't think I can talk that long. Um, I'm very honored to be recognized by my peers in the industry. Um, it has been um, a great place to work here. Um, uh, when I came in 87, I was looking for interesting and exciting projects. I definitely found a lot of them. Um, we're a full service city, so we get to do a lot of things. I mean, a lot of other agencies don't have the breadth and depth of interesting projects that we do. Um, my success is based on my staff and other staff in the city of Santa Cruz. Everybody works really hard. We work as a team on all these projects. It's not just public works, it's planning, it's parks, police, fire, we all work together to make this stuff happen. And. Um, it's been, it's been a great time, frustrating a lot of times as well, but we wonder how long, it why it takes so long to get certain projects done, and sometimes we're surprised and we get them done quickly. Uh, but it's been great. And so thank you very much for the opportunity. I think we have plenty more challenges coming up in the next uh, few years and forever. Um, one of our hardest right now is just trying to keep staff. And um, you know we used to be a little bit more competitive, but with the rising cost of housing and everything else here. Um, we've been lucky to attract local engineers and technical staff who've lived here before, who live here now, uh, but it's getting harder and harder to do that and to keep them, because everything's so busy, there's lots of opportunities elsewhere, and you know we haven't been able to keep up with uh, compensation as well. So anyway, it's a challenge, but luckily we have still have a great staff, and they really do work hard, and they work hard for the community. Thank you. Great. Chris, don't go anywhere. You can leave the photo up if you'd like. What was that? I said, don't go anywhere, and, you, okay. and, and they can leave the photo up if they'd like. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a second American Public Works Association Monterey Bay Chapter Award. The association has given its 2018 Project of the Year Award for projects less than $5 million to the City of Santa Cruz, TRC Solutions, and Granite Grot Construction for the Brants of Forty Creek Bicycle Pedestrian Bridge and Multi-Use Trail Project. I'd like to invite the city staff who participated on this project to join Chris at the podium at this time. Um, Transportation Manager Jim Burr, Public Works Director Mark Dettel, Transportation Planner Claire Fleisler, Engineer and Associate Curtis Burton Busenhart, City Arborist Leslie Keedy, and East Zone Park Supervisor Lori McCammon. Okay, as of last Saturday, let's give a round of applause for As of last September, the Branson Forty Creek Bicycle Pedestrian Bridge and Multi-Use Trail Project completed the gap in our five-mile river walk system. We now have a fully separate pathway for pedestrians and cyclists that keeps them safe from motor vehicle traffic the entire length of the river walk. 
The project is helping to increase walking, biking, and safety in Santa Cruz and supports the city's new Go Santa Cruz initiative, which includes work to expand active transportation facilities and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Project construction was funded with a $1.8 million California State Active Transportation Program grant and $400,000 in local gas tax funds. The annual American Public Works Association Monterey Bay Chapter Awards are based on a competitive process that includes review of project design and regulatory challenges, construction management and control techniques, safety performance, environmental considerations, and community relations. Congratulations to everyone for this APWA recognition and for giving Santa Cruz the Brants of Forty Creek Bike, Ped, Bridge, and Multi-Use Trail. Thank you. Now, now I'd like to get the award. Um, I just also wanted to recognize Nathan Noon, who was the project manager. Unfortunately, he's home with Poison Oak, so he couldn't make it. Oh, no. uh, but he worked really hard to get this project under construction. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no Poison Oak. <laughs> A lot of public work celebration, thanks. <laughs> so the next item on our agenda is um, uh, proc proclamation and, and recognition of the San Lorenzo River Month and celebrating river walk activities through the month of June. I'd like to invite up Beth Toby, our Arts Program Manager, and Michelle Williams, Executive Director of the Arts Council, Santa Cruz County. Good, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Beth Toby, the City's Arts Program Manager, and I'm really pleased to introduce two guests. I think Greg Pepping's coming up too, um, to tell you about the annual Ebb and Flow Festival coming up June 1st and 2nd. Um, and Michelle Williams and Greg Pepping from Arts Council Santa Cruz County and Coastal Watershed Council are the lead partners on this amazing project. So I'm gonna let them take it away. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members. Thank you for uh, letting us be here today. We are so excited to invite you to Ebb and Flow on June 1st and 2nd. To truly know what Ebb and Flow is, you need to experience it, and uh, we're gonna make that possible for four short minutes. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see some familiar faces here. There is something elemental about living by water. I don't know if everybody feels it, but I do. It calms you down. It makes you feel a bit of a vastness and your place in nature. In 2014, I got together some of the greatest minds in Santa Cruz. And we got in a room and we had this incredible opportunity from the California Arts Council who was seed funding large projects that addressed creative placemaking, community connections, and community building. And an hour and a half later, Ebb and Flow was born. The impetus of this came out of this idea that we have this incredible public space in Santa Cruz along the River Walk that is highly underutilized, that is connected to the Tannery Art Center, which is the most diverse art center in the nation, which itself is also underutilized. And we just thought, what's a powerful thing that we could all do together that would help each of us meet our discrete missions that could help change Santa Cruz for the better? The concept just blew us away. The idea of getting a, a ton of people on the levee, activating it, the, the sculptures, the activity, bringing together so many different facets of the community with a resource that we all love was just brilliant. For many years, the San Lorenzo River has been an afterthought, and for some even more than that, it's been some place to avoid. Whereas when people come back to the river and rediscover it, I think they see what a gem it is. It's a green space in the heart of our downtown. It's the longest city park that we have here in Santa Cruz, and every day, kids and families and commuters are using it to walk and bike, get exercise, and simply move from point A to point B. I think a lot of people actually drive over it, you know, walk by it, don't recognize or realize that we have this amazing you know, river running through our city. And this 
transforms the way that people think about it and experience it and interact with it. And that's a pretty amazing thing to do. The first thing you really have to do is create that spark, get people to care. Why is there fishing rods hanging off the bridge? Why is there weaving happening along this bridge that I go by every day? It's that curiosity that art can really open in people. What's great about it is there's so many different ways to interact with the river in part of that event. And it crosses the really broad demographic of our community. So it's really, I think, drawing people out to an event and activities that aren't necessarily like, you know, it's not like we're actually touching or getting in the river or something like that, but they're related to it. And so it's getting people to think about that the river's even there. I thought a lot about what an artist community does, and I think it does enable people to come together for a reason. And I think that's what Ebb and Flow does. People are going to come to Ebb and Flow who have no idea that the San Lorenzo provides two-thirds of our drinking water, who have no idea the number of species who call the San Lorenzo home. But they'll come away with this new information and they won't even know they were learning. And that's one of the great things is the arts gives a new pathway into all of this knowledge and then allow them to fall in love with it as well. This city is here because the river's here. It's our lifeblood. It's not just that it's important for environmental reasons or ecology reasons or habitat reasons or even natural beauty. The river runs through our city and it runs through our history and it's what makes Santa Cruz possible. Very nice. Nice. <laughs>
We partner with the city, Public Works, Parks and Rec, Water Department. Our efforts complement the efforts of, the ongoing efforts of the Police Department to bring positive activity to the river to protect the water quality and improve the habitat. And actually collectively, the city, the county, enviros like us, we're only so good at reaching the community and engaging that, that, that positive activity and excitement. And then when you get the arts community involved, when you get artists, and not just an artist community, but this artist community, it's a, a total game changer. It's an entirely different operation. It's a different game of teaching people about the river. In recent years, we've learned with the community that it is part of our history. It was quote unquote discovered by Spanish, Spanish explorers when they first arrived here and native people were using the river. It's been a part of our economy historically. It's still, as uh, was mentioned in the video, it's still a major drinking water source. It's home to threatened and endangered species. It's 30 miles long, starting up near Castle Rock State Park. It is um, a flood protection project down here in the lower river and on and on and on, including the opportunity to right next to downtown, have a green space where people can get away from technology and they can go and restore with nature. So the reason I bring those things up is because there's a lot of fun in this Ebb and Flow River Festival and we make sure that people go home with those factoids, with those river facts, with that sense of belonging to a community that identifies with the river, with an awareness of how we impact the river every day and how the river is part of our daily lives. So in the midst of all the fun and creativity, people take home some education and awareness of the river because we protect what we know and love and the Ebb and Flow River Festival is an opportunity to get to know the river and to love it. So we welcome you to come out uh, June 1st and 2nd to the festival and thank you for proclaiming the entire month, the uh, San Lorenzo River Month. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll do that, I'll do that right now. Can I, can I add one, uh, one unique request? And I'll challenge you. We actually gave you, um, Michelle passed out hats. This morning we were successful in challenging and asking the Board of Supervisors to put on their hats. Um, you all have nicer hair to worry about than I do, but we had the Board of Supervisors put on their hats and, and huddle together for a photo. We would love that, and you're going for it. Thank you for that. I'm gonna have hat okay. hair now. For the so I'd like to, to present you this proclamation um, Santa Cruz became a community from its very origin because of the San Lorenzo River. And the San Lorenzo River is our primary source of drinking water and serves as a critical habitat for fish and wildlife. And the city renewed its commitment to the River Walk in 2016 by establishing a River Walk engagement plan in partnership with community groups and continued that work with a River Walk summit, summit in 2017. The Coastal Watershed Council and Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History offer a series of bird and wildlife walks on the River Walk called Exploring the San Lorenzo River. And the Arts Council, Santa Cruz County, and the Santa Cruz Arts Commission have brought forth the fourth Ebb and Flow River Arts Festival to be celebrated in partnership with the city, the Coastal Watershed Council, the Museum of Art and History, and others to enliven and activate the Santa Cruz w River Walk through artistic expression. Now, therefore, I, David Tarasas, on behalf of the City Council, uh, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2018 as San Lorenzo River Month and encourage all citizens to learn more about the San Lorenzo River and to, to, uh, to participate in the river festivities throughout the month of June and especially during the Ebb and Flow River Arts Festival on June 1st and June 2nd, 2018. So, You all look beautiful. <laughs> Let me take them off now. <laughs> I'm getting hat hair. Oh no! Wait, are you gonna? We're gonna get hat hair. <laughs> I like them though. Okay, the next um, item I'm very uh, honored to present is um, in regards to uh, U.S. Lifeguarding, Lifeguarding Association Beach Safety Week. Um, each year as summer begins, the United States Lifeguarding, Lifesaving Association sponsors National Beach Safety Week in an effort to remind beachgoers to use caution in the aquatic environment. National Beach Safety Week begins the Monday before Memorial Day and ends seven days later on Memorial Day Monday. 
The objective of Natural Beach Safety Week is to make citizens aware of the need to be safe while in and near the water with special emphasis on the hazards associated with rip currents. Representatives from the Fire Department and Parks and Recreation Department will accept the proclamation proclaiming May 21st, May and through 28th as National Beach Safety Week. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Brandon Yamasaki and also um, your, any others that would like to speak. <laughs> Uh, I brought up Colin Herrick. He uh, works with the Park and Rec and the Lifeguard Division as our junior lifeguard lieutenant, and he helps uh, start the process of bringing our lifeguards into this, the city program. And I also brought up uh, Marine Safety Officer Brendan Daly, who's my right-hand man that helps me run the beach and all the special events that happen down there. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the recognition uh, for the lifeguards. Uh, annually, we are we have about a million visitors that visit our beach every summer, and we are protecting the coastline all the way from the county line. We assist mutual aid with state lifeguards, and we uh, also help with the Harbor Lifeguard Tower and Capitola Lifeguard Towers. So we're very busy and spread out through the beach. Uh, annually, we have, uh, we have about 200,000 contacts with individuals on our beach, and we provide first aid, we provide assistance, we provide safety, so remember to, one, sign your kids up for junior lifeguards, and two, if uh, you have a question about safety and where a good place to be on the beaches, uh, feel free to come talk to our, contact, our lifeguard towers or our vehicle guards, and we'd love to assist you. All right, well, I just want to say, I am, I'm, I'll just read two lines from this because I think it's important for the community. Um, the aquatic environment has dangers, particularly rip currents that can be effectively managed through public awareness and the vigilance of professional lifeguards. For reasons of public safety, an annual reminder of the joys and hazards associated with the aquatic environment is appropriate at the commencement of the busy summer beach season. The Santa Cruz community and visitors alike must remember, learn to swim, swim near a lifeguard, swim with a buddy, and check with the lifeguards. Use sunscreen and drink water, obey posted signs and flags, and keep the beach and water clean. L learn rip current safety and enter the water feet first and wear a life jacket where, when appropriate. <laughs> and so on that point, I'd again, um, like to thank you for all the work you do every day and especially during this time, we uh, declare uh, May 21st through 2018 as National uh, Beach Safety Week in the city of Santa Cruz and urge everyone using our beaches to enjoy themselves at the beach this year while taking appropriate measures to protect themselves and their children. Like I need a drink of water. That was a lot of proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Mr. Lynn Dutton is our technician this evening and we'd like to thank him for his work today. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of the chambers. At this point, I'd like to ask all council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I'll move on. As the, um, and I'd like to ask the city clerk if there are any additions or deletions to there the agenda. Not. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda 
Oral communications will generally occur at the conclusion of our afternoon business at or around 5.30 p.m., but may occur before or after 5.30 p.m., depending on uh, where we are on our agenda. At this point in the agenda, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the city attorney, um, acting city attorney at this point, to provide a report on closed session. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, city Council met in closed session to discuss two items, uh, public employee performance evaluation and uh, conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation. There was no reportable action taken. Thank you. Okay. And is there a city manager report? Uh, there's no report this week. Okay. Thank you. First up on our agenda is the uh, consent agenda. These are items four through eight on our agenda. Let me just double check that. I heard someone up here. No, I think that's four through eight. Else, someone yeah. four through eight on uh, the on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. And I heard from Vice Mayor Watkins. She'd like to pull item number six from the agenda. So that will be pulled. Are there any other members who would like to pull an item from the consent agenda other than item number six? Seeing none, I'd like to turn it over to the public. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak to any other item um, on our consent other than item six at this time? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for deliberation and action. Second. Okay, motion by council member Matthews, second by council member Chase for items, um, all items on consent except for number six. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So I'd like to move on to item six. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to first start by uh, just briefly kind of thanking and acknowledging our city council for back in November approving a 1% uh, sales tax increase to cannabis uh, revenues to go towards our commitment and longstanding um, dedication to, towards our earliest uh, residents and, and vulnerable youth populations in our community. So uh, thank you for your, for your uh, dedication in moving that policy forward. Um, as stated in the council policy, it's our understanding that every year we will review uh, a way to allocate the dollars in a fashion that's aligned with our intentions as a city. And in preparation for the upcoming budget hearings, uh, council member Matthews, uh, I mean, sorry, council member Chase and myself prepared uh, a gender report outlining a strategy that is looking to optimize um, the dollars knowing that the need is, is vast and um, there's some ways that we can leverage our resources to best meet those needs. Um, with a commitment to serving early childhood education with half of the revenue, as well as also allowing discretionary and advisement from our city schools a committee and community programs committee to look at how to optimize the dollars for prevention in vulnerable youth populations. So in preparation for the upcoming um, budget process, we've prepared this agenda item to be uh, considered by council for um, moving this upcoming fiscal year, as well as to hear the community in terms of any input they may have on it. And of course, any questions from the council or input as well. Are there any initial council questions at this time? Uh, council Member Cron? Thanks. Um, and it, it's good. I was called Council Member uh, Watkins and she said she has already had spoken with two other council members. Uh, and so you can't speak to more than two other council members. It would be a, a violation of the Brown Act. So we get to have this conversation uh, in public, which uh, you know I greatly appreciate. I'm just wondering about uh, the two groups that were cited here. It wasn't clear to me if we are only, you know, if the money is only going to the, on page 6.2, 50% of the revenue is gonna go to Thrive for Three and 50% of the revenue is gonna go to uh, vulnerable youth populations as recommended by the Santa Cruz City Schools Committee, or are these just recommendations and it's gonna be open to all uh, organizations that um, work with young people or kids? I think you know it will be open to conversation and process as it goes through the Community Programs Committee. Essentially, this is laying a framework that is looking at existing efforts that are happening within our community that have been able to leverage and sort of at that systems level optimize the dollars. Um, my hope is that we can maintain a commitment to early childhood education. I think many of you know I feel very passionate about that. 
and by saying and designating a minimum 50% of the revenue, we can do that. The, there is an, a movement underway, and I know the director of First Five is here, um, as well as our Child Care Planning Council um, coordinator, in terms of how to come together as a community in terms of the early childhood movement and look at ways to align and leverage existing efforts. And so um, in anticipation of that being an existing advisory model that we can explore looking at and, and the benefit it could provide to our city, the proposal is to explore that at this point. with 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 the disclaimer that 50% will no matter what be, be allocated to, towards early childhood. In terms of the second portion, which is the vulnerable youth populations and prevention, the, the thought behind that is that there is an existing uh, city uh, schools city committee that meets on a regular basis to identify overlaps in ways to support each other's work. And knowing that there are the experts on the field tracking the on kind of the current needs of the, of the vulnerable youth populations and prevention needs of the students in our city, that would be a nice way to have their input in terms of how we can meet those needs. So with, with all a community process happening at the community programs level with ultimate authority going to the city council on an annual basis essentially is the framework identified. I do realize that this is sort of uh, kind of, this is new territory, right? And so when we made the commitment um, that is incredible and we, I am hoping can be in action knowing that we will fine tune this on an annual basis and needs will change annually. Um, but we are gonna start now investing in kids and making that a priority. And so that's the hope and sort of the design of the framework. Just, just to follow up, how much money are we, did we, co you know, was collected last year in uh, the cannabis tax, 1% of it? My understanding was there was about uh, 60 or 70,000 from uh, Marcus, but I don't see him here. And, or maybe Martine, you might know. I think that's about right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be clear that it's going to go to the programs committee also, and then without tying the hands, you know, on certain rec certain council members' recommendations, because right. I, I totally support this, and I think it's a great thing, and I supported you when you brought it up. Thank so you. I just want to, I do want to see it, but I, I want there to be some latitude um, for council to have input. Absolutely. Do you want to go, go this way, Councilmember Matthews? Answering that question, I asked that earlier this morning, and. Um, the previous staff report when that action was taken was that the range in a full year could be uh, up to 120,000. Thank you. Do, do, do you have any, to Council Member Chase? other comments. Council we'll Member Chase? Speak. I just, thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of add to the point that Vice Mayor Watkins made about the model and um, I just, I really, I signed on to this because I really appreciate the recommended model here because this is outside the purview that the city typically operates in. And so I think what we've done here is really recommended taking advantage of systems that are already in place where there's experts that are really weighing in on this. And the city has, the council did make a commitment to designate these dollars. And so rather than creating a new function of the city, we're actually utilizing the resources the experts that already exist in the community, but with a very clear focus on the youth in the city. So I, I appreciate that model being brought forward. Anyone else questions at this time? No. Okay, I'd like to turn it over to the public at this point. If there's any comments on or questions or you'd like to make, please begin. You have two minutes. Hi, council members. My name is Allison Guevara. I'm a social impact consultant focusing on uh, supporting children and working families. Um, you've heard from me before on this issue and I'm just really happy to see it brought to this point and I think that this is a really smart and thoughtful framework. Um, I had the privilege of um, facilitating a forum with about 30 parents of zero to three year olds a couple weekends ago with the Santa Cruz Community Health Center. There was a mom who shared a story about her caring for her special needs baby, working full time and being a full time student while in recovery. And the only way she was able to do that was by the graces and luck of having a friend's parents care for her baby. And the general feeling from this group was that so many of these issues facing young children and their families are afterthoughts in our community and in society. And I know that we are part of a movement in this city and in this county to shift that so that we are truly prioritizing the needs of these young children. So I just wanna really emphasize the importance of allocating those funds to the early childhood um, programs and needs. I think there's great work underway to, that we can just leverage that and um, make the most of the, the precious dollars that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to this item? If any member of the public would like to speak, please stand so that we can see, get a read on how many people are planning to speak. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council, um, uh, Mayor. 
Um, my name is David Brody. I'm the executive director of the First Five Santa Cruz County Commission. Um, on behalf of our commission, I just want to commend the council for taking leadership in this area and the creation of a children's fund. Um, I think most of you are aware, but uh, in case any of you aren't, First Five Santa Cruz County is a commission that supports the healthy development of all kids zero through five in Santa Cruz County. Um, we fund and administer and help run uh, programs involving parent education, home visitation, early literacy, preschool support, quality improvement in preschool and early care and education environments, to name a few. Um, one of our newer responsibilities is helping administer the countywide Thrive by Three Fund. In particular, we house um, an advisory committee um, uh, of our commission uh, dedicated solely to providing um, uh, advice and counsel um, to all parties regarding the implementation of the Thrive by Three initiative. Uh, we also uh, are running the evaluation with our partners at Applied Survey Research, and we are currently administering something we call the Early Learning Scholarship Program, which is a very innovative approach to injecting resources into our child care community in a way that targets our most vulnerable children uh, while injecting critical resources for our providers um, for, the, for the amazing work that they do. So I just wanna say again, on behalf of our commission, thank you for the creation of this children fund. We completely understand it doesn't always feel exactly natural for cities and jurisdictions to engage in this way, but it just takes practice, uh, and you're in very good company in making this type of commitment to our youngest kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Diane Munoz, and I'm coordinator of the Childhood Advisory Council, Santa Cruz County. I'm here this afternoon. Um, to encourage you to approve uh, this allocation to uh, of the county can cannabis tax. Um, I, I'm also a member of the Thrive by Three Advisory Committee as well, where I um, provide information on the child care industry as well as data. Um, I support the allocation of the cannabis um, business tax um, to a designated children's fund um, for early education and youth programming to support prevention for our vulnerable, vulnerable youth and populations here in Santa Cruz. Um, so I encourage you today to approve this innovative proposal. Uh, that will support your most vulnerable citizens, which are children and families. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Yvette Brooks, and I work for the North Santa Cruz County SELPA. The SELPA stands for Special Education Local Plan Area. At this point in time, special education is only partially funded by the state, and school districts have to backfill the rest of um, the rest of the funds with general funds. It is so hard to hear our county superintendents struggle monthly on how hard it is to find a balance. On one side, special education students must be served birth to 22, as well as students in general education must receive quality education. One thing that resonates with me the most is that there is, a, there is hard line evidence that proves that both special education students and general education students will be more successful if they receive quality early intervening services and education. However, even though our state knows this, they still only fund a very small percentage overall of, um, of a child's education and cities have to come up with the rest. This is where you as elected officials come in. Not often do we see a brand new revenue stream and, oppor and opportunity to find, uh, finally put money where it matters. So you know most of our cities are in crisis dealing with homelessness, drug addiction, and crime. And studies show that investing early reduces these numbers drastically. I've been working with other elected officials. I am gonna be running for Capitola City Council and we, I'll be proposing the same thing and have proposed the same thing with our members there. And by collaborating these jurisdictions with the Thrive by Three initiative, by pulling our funds together, we will be able to utilize the systems that the Thrive by Three initiative have in place already. And take a look, um, and to take a look at their pilot programs that uh, David just recently mentioned to see what um, best fits our community's needs. I truly appreciate all of you for holding yourselves accountable and investing in early education. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for deliberation. Council Member Brown. Uh, 
There are so many things I'd love to say about this um, item. I First, I just want to thank um, Vice Mayor Watkins and Council Member Chase for bringing it to us and being really deliberative about how um, you're, you thought about structuring where the funding will go and how we make those decisions. So thank you for that. And as a member of the both of the committees that will be um, <laughs> bringing recommendations to um, everybody at the council, uh, I'd like to just move the, the recommendation. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Motion by Council Member Brown, second by Vice Mayor Watkins. I still have some, some questions and things about this that I want to kind of talk through, and I think others do, so I think we might have a little bit more process. I don't know if you'd like to go first or? I'm happy to. I, go ahead. Um, I also appreciate the intention behind this. As council members know, um, I was um, not enthusiastic about designating this additional percentage specifically for a children's fund. Anyone who's paying any attention at all knows that we are in, um, have been and are in very um, trying and challenging fiscal situation for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and having said that, I only voted for this with the uh, language being changed to be quite broad. So the language that we adopted was that the Children's Fund would support enhancement and expansion of evidence-based programs to prioritize access to early childhood development, prevention, and vulnerable youth populations without supplanting existing City of Santa Cruz services or investments. I am, uh, again, reluctantly willing to support the motion if we drop the direction that 50% goes to Thrive by Three and 50% goes to um, programs recommended by city schools. I think it's appropriate that we ask the Community Programs Committee to review the recommendations. Um, the Community Programs Committee also reviews allocations from Housing and Urban Development, which in part support um, uh, social programs and facilities. Um, tune in on June 6th when we have our budget hearings. We do not know what kind of cuts. All of our departments already in preparing their budgets have been asked to, uh, they took cuts last year. They're being asked to make cuts in the budget that has been presented to us. Uh, some departments deeper cuts than others, and we don't know. We may be facing even further cuts beyond that. So. Um, I think uh, those of us who are close to um, the, the toll that this fiscal strain has taken on the city, uh, we struggle to present, to uh, provide a teen center, summer jobs for kids, uh, the pride program for at-risk youth. I mean, it's, it's, I think, not accurate to say that we're gonna start supporting youth. I think the city has a long, long record through our core community programs allocations and our internal allocations. And so um, for those reasons, um, I would support an amendment or ask the uh, maker of the motion to, to delete the specific direction. It's been said that that will lay a framework, but I think laying a framework creates an expectation and I don't think we are in a good position to do that. So I would ask that you remove the specific direction and leave simply that the uh, uh, revenue would be um, uh, uh, decided upon through recommendations from community programs. Well, if I may just respond to that, I think that this doesn't preclude any additional recommendation or conversation about how the revenues will be allocated or ultimately the direction it will go. And what this does is identify a framework to set the priorities, as well as the framework to leverage partnerships that will enhance the dollar amount. So I don't um, feel comfortable doing that. I also just, I think one of the things that I feel is worth stating is we share your and um, uh, your comments around the extraordinary times we're approaching in terms of the fiscal challenges. This was a commitment on behalf of the city to say, regardless, we're going to prioritize children. And what we set up here today is a way to do that that will optimize those dollars. And I think we just heard briefly earlier that um, we're struggling to find people to work here and to stay here. And childcare is a huge barrier to being able to work in this community. And I think this allows us to meet the needs of our residents in prioritizing our earliest, um, um, particularly our earliest children that I'd like to leave it as um, identified, knowing that there will be 
a process for further conversation in the future. So at this point, I don't feel comfortable accepting that. And the maker of the motion agrees. <laughs> oh, do you want Chris, go ahead. Well, I'm just trying to understand, um, Cynthia, are you saying that, say that for instance, the 70,000, that estimated 70,000, estimated 120,000 from next year, would still be spent on uh, early childhood programs, but you just don't want it to be locked in the way it is here, or you want more leeway to spend that, that, that money on um, filling our budget deficit? Oh, no, 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 that it was spent broadly on programs related to early childhood youth programming and prevention for vulnerable youth populations. That was the language. Because I think the gap right now is early childhood, that we're not, you know, we do fund children's programs, like you said, but I think the, the earlier zero to three, for example, are, you know, I don't know if we're investing um, very much right now. Thank you. Okay, I, I'd like to just make a quick comment then. Okay, one, one of those is, I mean, I appreciate that I think, you know, for I totally agree with um, Vice Mayor Watkins. I think we need to do more for youth in the community in terms of how we invest in um, our youth populations. I think we've seen all our priorities kind of move in different directions, and I think this is really a clear statement that, you know, families and youth matter in our city, and we need to do more to do it. I just want to make sure that the recommendations that we have here are focused on really concentrating the resources that are in the city within the city. And it, because I look at the, the recommendation, the motion, um, a little different than what you have in the background. And so I just wanna make sure that when we talk about supporting youth prevention and the vulnerable youth populations, that it's really, that these, these monies are targeting programs and services within the city of Santa Cruz and not, and maybe even being used to leverage monies that are available outside to help um, programs that exist here in the city. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I, um, I be happy to incorporate language. I see that you have something right in there oh. if you want in terms okay. of to in say it's city specific. Cindy's the maker of the motion. Oh, I apologize. So. Yeah. If you Council Member Narayan. To do that. So I, I'm, I'm having a difficult time with this too because what essentially we're being asked to do is give money to an entity outside of the city. And that's where I'm having problems with this because I look at our parks and our playgrounds. There's obviously a lot of maintenance that's needed there. I look at the fact that we have um, a lot of programs, it's not zero to three, but it is a lot of programs like our, um, you know, junior lifeguards or summer camps. And parents use those programs that are pretty low cost for their kids as a way to have a place for them to be during the summer while they're still going to work. So they serve a really important purpose. And we have a teen center that has been so close to closing on a couple of occasions because of the lack of money. And then when we're looking at our own fiscal problems, um, I'm just not comfortable dedicating money to third parties. And especially when we know that the county's gonna have their own cannabis tax as well. Um, and so I just wanna make it really clear, if I don't support this, it's not because I don't support early childhood education, I don't support it through this mechanism. I support making sure that the city is really solid on its own programs, which I don't think we are, before we decide to start and partner a whole new third party program. I made for clarification. I, do, I think there might be a little bit of a misunderstanding in terms of what um, this designation could look like and as it relates to Thrive by Three or a complementary program. Essentially what's being asked is that we are stating that this above and beyond investment will have a portion, which is 50% of the portion, to be allocated to early childhood education. The mechanism is used to leverage dollars in existing infrastructure to then reinvest those dollars back into the city and the city's students and kids. So what it does actually by going through an existing a mechanism like that is, is it limits a, creating a new infrastructure, bureaucracy around it, maximizes those dollars and then reinvest it straight back into the kids. So if anything, we're gonna gain by contributing to something that's already existing. That doesn't necessarily mean that will be what will always exist, but it's a structure that's already being kind of outlined. And so ultimately looking at how at minimum we're gonna commit to early childhood education for 50% of the dollars is the biggest ask I'd say. And I just wanna follow up on you said that it's not necessarily something that we would do all the time. After serving on the community programs, um, committee for a couple of years, um, you know, while the city has absolutely no obligation to provide that money for nonprofits, we do because it's our values. 
um, when we've had to look in the past at cutting because our own budgets were being cut for a variety of reasons, we had people here screaming at us and saying, you know, you're cutting us, that's our money, and it became very much expected. And so um, when I worked for the state as well, I saw that happen because I worked for the state when the recession hit and organizations when it was like, look, we've lost almost 50% of our revenue and it was time to cut programs. It was taken as you're cutting us as opposed to recognizing that the programs were never meant to be permanent. Once you start something, um, and you have to shift, it's a very painful process. And so oh, sure. that's why I'm having a hard time, the idea of taking on something new w when we're having our own economic issues, I've never seen as necessarily a wise choice to make. You know, now if we were saying it's one-time money, that's different. Um, but even then, I just really think that s city money needs to stay in the city to really prop up our own programs that we have for youth. Um, Council Member Chase. Yeah. So I, I just want to clarify, and I think that there is a part of the agenda report that, that can ex help explain things. Uh, right in the middle of the second page, it says 100% of the revenue to be programmed through the Community <coughs> Programs Committee. So all the dollars mm -hmm. will still go through the Community Programs Committee um, with recommendations to the full council, so still comes back to the full council on an annual basis. And then the 50% through the countywide Thrive by Three, where they're weighing in on the recommendations to that that would then, again, go to the Community Programs Committee and then to the full council. Um, and so it's, it's really those bodies are recommending body that can help to, like uh, Vice Mayor Watkins said, help to increase the funds and the resources. And either way, it's coming back to the Community Programs uh, committee as the place where that's vetted and then ultimately the city council still decides. So 100% of the dollars are still going to city programs, city funded programs and city residents. So that part's not changing. And then the part, the latter part of your point is we're not, we already designated this, right? The council designated this already. So that's not what we're deciding today. And we might have to in a future decision do something else with the cannabis resources. But for today, it's just about, we already made that decision. So what mechanism are we gonna use to determine how those dollars will be allocated? And this was the recommendation. Right. And but I know we already forward. made that yeah, decision yeah. to allocate it towards children. I'm, And I'm not saying <laughs> that I'm against that. I'm saying I'd like to keep it within the realm of already existing city programs. Um, council Member Matthews and Council, oh no, who, I don't know, Council Member Matthews and Council Member Brown. I wonder if you'd consider language that uh, approximately 50% of the revenue to focus on early childhood development programs serving city residents and approximately 50% of the revenue to focus on prevention and vulnerable youth populations in the city of Santa Cruz as recommended by Santa Cruz City Schools and uh, other community sources. Because I think we should ask our Parks and Rec commitment, for example, and, and I just want to, if I may, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, well, let me just, yeah, you can, let me just say we have one. I will say that the parks and rec um, representatives kind of, they, they chair the city schools committee. They're in those meetings. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. council member Brown. I, I actually think that um, council member Chase covered my comments. So, okay. Vice mayor Walker. I, I, I agree. I think we, what we have already is written up in a way that I think sets the framework up for us to uh, fine tune as we move forward with the, the appropriate um, levels of input throughout the different stages of the process. So at this point, I feel comfortable with as it's written. Do you know what what was being suggested was by Council Member Matthews was in alignment? I think what we were going in terms of within the city. Which is, and so which is I right. think we could just I think just adding what we already accepted, which was within the recommendation after to support us uh, prevention and vulnerable youth populations within the city covers that. Yeah. And, so, and also focus on early child development programs serving city residents. Right, within the city, that's the city residents, okay. In both, both clauses. I think that I, that makes sense, um, you know. I okay. just figured we'd fig work that out in terms of the, you know, the metrics and the, me you know, the evaluation of the you know, funding, where Here's the funding goes, but if, but I'm okay with that. If Once you, uh, if you want to restate it, because I, that's exactly the direction I thought in terms of keeping it, because there's discussion in there that does have strict percentages, but the motion is more to, one, set up the fund and how it's used and how it's looked at in the committees will come up with whatever recommendations based on those funds okay. that are available. 
So um, the recommendation is to, uh, the motion is to allocate the city's children fund for fiscal year 2018, 2019 to fund early childhood development, youth programming, and to support prevention in vulnerable youth populations within the city of Santa Cruz with recommendations by the city schools committee and the community programs committee. That meet. But where's the thread by three thing? That's this the, is the that's overall the, recommendation. That's the this motion language. The motion recommendation. So we're not naming th thrive by three Thri specifically? I mean, Thrive by Three is, the, the, the bigger umbrella is early childhood education. Thrive by Three is what's sort of happening right now for us to explore as a way to maximize the dollars. But ultimately, okay. the consistent investment will be early childhood education. That's if this is a good mechanism that's gonna help us um, leverage dollars, wonderful. If not, we can look at other ways to do that. But I don't think it doesn't, it, it's worth exploring as a way since it's already an existing movement underway to, to try to sort of, uh, com, you know, partner with. With, there will be more, more conversation in the, in the coming months. Councilmember Matthews. So just if I could, so your recommendation is not the specifics that are shown on page two. I mean, the recommendation is Be written clear. in the motion. Okay, it's this thing that's on page one. Yeah. yeah. With um, some clause about serving city of Santa Cruz residents inserted in there. Within the city of Santa Cruz, yes. It's the framework, essentially. This is outlining how we would ask these groups to move forward with it, but it's the framework that we're approving. So, I could, Brown. Just, just to try to um, finish this up. Uh, the motion is to allocate the city's cannabis business tax mm -hmm. children's fund for fiscal year 2019 mm -hmm. to fund early childhood development, youth programming, and to support prevention and vulnerable youth populations within the city of Santa Cruz with recommendations mm -hmm. by the Community Programs Committee and the C Schools Committee. So it's, it's including period. Uh, yep. period. That's it. period. 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 Thank okay, you. that's a motion by. Um, Council Member Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. Is there any further discussion on this? Yeah, okay, I, I think the motion's clear. Uh, Council Member Noroyan? I just want to say, you know, we're taking on funding and something new. Just want to make sure we're all very clear about that. And then if we, you know, are in a position to not be able to fund it the following year, get ready for people to be really upset with us. Um, if we need to look at that money and say where well, our own youth programs are not um, you know, funded because of our own fiscal crisis, just get ready for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm having a hard time with this. I still may vote for it because I'm glad to see that we've acknowledged it should be within the city. But, you know, I, I, if our parks were all perfect and beautifully painted and the fences were perfect and the, the, you know, none of the yard equipment needed to be replaced, then I understand going to something like this. But that's not the situation. So I'm... It's terrible because my heart really believes in early childhood education, but I'm having a difficult time um, with the process and with the fact that, you know, rarely do we have anyone come to the city and say, we're gonna help fund your programs by partnering with you. It's most of the time it's the city going out and saying, here's a chunk of money to help run your, you know, your program or to enhance it. So I, I look forward to the day when someone actually approaches us and wants to partner with us on housing or something that the city desperately needs. So um, that's, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this one. Vice Mayor Watkins. I mean, I'll just briefly respond that when we made the decision to increase the cannabis tax by 1% against our staff's recommendation to leave it at the minimum of 7%, we committed that 1% to this policy of supporting early childhood education, vulnerable youth populations and prevention. I'm hopeful that that does not change, knowing that that was the intention of the increase of the cannabis tax. One investment in kids does not um, isolate or remove another investment in our city of a longstanding commitment to parks. And I think that we're gonna maintain that. That's our commitment. This is above and beyond saying, no matter what, we're gonna choose to invest in kids. And we made that decision with the policy. That again has been mentioned by council member Chase as a decision that was previously made by this council. What is being proposed now is us being in action, knowing that families are leaving this community and that we have a gap to fill in supporting our youngest residents. We support a number of other things. And this is laying out a framework 
work to do so and hopes that we can start to make a difference in people's lives. So it doesn't necessarily negate the ability to do another thing. It's just saying, in addition to, we're going to make a longstanding commitment to kids. So I just want to be clear that that's what the but, intention of the but policy it does, was. It does negate it, though, when we run out of money and we can't support traditional services through Parks and Rec. And, you know, we do have this, you know, and instead of using it for what our core city services are, we're gonna be spending it on this. And I'm so we are making that decision. Right. And right, we are making that decision. We're making a decision that we're not going to take the extra money we gather from this and put it into our, our core city services when we do have parks and we do have other youth programs that could really use this funding. I, I, okay. Mr. Brown. Um, this is, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but I just do want to say I'm looking forward to budget hearings and our discussion about all of the places where we may be able to find money in the Santa Cruz city budget that can help us, um, you know, work on our priorities as a community. So, uh, you know, I, your point is well taken, Council Member Narayan, but I think in this case right now, we did make this commitment and it would be nice to just follow through. And I think this is a really good approach. Hey, Councilmember Chase. Well, and now Councilmember Brown actually made the majority of the points that I wanted to make, but I do want to recognize Councilmember Neroyan's point, and I appreciate your focus on the fact that we are facing some serious, serious fiscal challenges. The, the issue today is that we already designated this, and so it's really, since we designated it, how are we going to make the decision to allocate it? So mm -hmm. it could very well come back to this council and we'll make a different decision in the future, um, and we we'll have to make some very difficult decisions in the very near future. Um, but yeah, that's all. Council Member Matthews. I'll just say briefly, uh, I will support the motion as it's now stated with the period where the period is. Yep. I was uh, uh, really, um, uh, I had problems on the specificity that was in, this, in the agenda report. But uh, as I read the recommendation before us, it could fund both um, new, it could help support new activities or it could help support our internal activities that meet these same goals. So Absolutely. with that understanding, I'm gonna support the motion. Right, okay, is there any further discussion? Council Member um, Crum. Yeah, I just wanna, is that what you understand too, Council Member Watkins, what Council Member Matthews just said, that this will backfill money that um, may be cut uh, because of budget deficit? I think that in the policy, it states that this is not going to be used to ex supplant existing city services, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that it precludes an opportunity for us to look at ways that it could creatively support or enhance city, or yeah. enhance city yeah. services. Yeah. So I think it's just, I think we can find money to to sort of, to, to Councilmember Brown's point, to reflect our priorities. This was a little bit above and beyond saying, this has been a significantly underinvested population, and we're going to make a choice as a governing body to invest differently. And um, and we have we know we have gaps in faux par scholarships, for example. And this could be something that could also be looked at for that. So it's not saying that it's yeah. not going to be. It's just not going to be used to kind of go towards our general fund at the discretion of our city manager's office, but it's gonna to go towards the council saying, no matter what, we're gonna prioritize kids with the right partnerships, um, hopefully long standing, since we did make the conscious decision to increase it for that purpose. I, so I just wanna make um, clarification before we vote. So if we decide and that, you know, we look at the budget and we just realize we, we don't have the money to even do basic part maintenance, can this money, can we decide as a council to move that money in that direction? This, this doesn't like uh, forbid us from doing that, right? I think, I mean, I think that would be a different conversation at a different time for that hypothetical situation. Well, but I, before for the I vote for it, I'd like to, I think, before I vote for it, I'd like to know though. The council uh, policy is is what's written in terms of the, in terms of how the recommendations good. will come forward through our community programs committee and then before the city council in terms of hypotheticals, I think will be forthcoming. So at this point, I think it's just appropriate to stick to what the proposal yeah, is. I think that I think the council votes on the budget annually and makes those decisions on where those funding goes. I think what we're hearing here is a commitment to youth and youth programs and I I think at this point, if there's so if I still am I'm not getting my question answered. <laughs> That's okay, the well, I'll ask the city manager so, to, yeah, if you'd like to, to have answer the city that manager question. Answer. I mean, what would what would uh, uh, carry would be the city council adopted policy, uh, which which clarify. I mean, which doesn't exclude the use of the funds for city related programs, but it, it is clear about that it be used for you know youth oriented and, and it specifies. Okay. 
those purposes. So I would argue, you know, it doesn't seem like maintenance would, would, would be appropriate uh, given the council adopted policy, but that, that is your policy. So well, maintenance won't be appropriate, but other youth programs with, that the city runs would? Yes. Okay, thank you. If I could see if there was a, a youth daycare center that's operating in the city that, um, making facilities or providing equipment might be something that you Absolutely. do. So, I mean, I, I do think that okay. there's related right. things that go on with it. It's just how we prioritize those programs for youth. Okay, that's, thank you. I need a clarification on that before voting. Okay, I think we've discussed enough. Any other further discussion? So we'll like to um, put this to a vote. We have a motion by um, uh, Council Member Brown, second by Vice Mayor Watkins. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that motion passes unanimously. Thank you for bringing that forward. Okay, the next item is our consent public hearings item. Um, th these are items numbers nine and 10 on our agenda. These items will be acted on with just one motion unless pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on either of these items? Yeah, I would pull number nine. Okay, council member Crohn's pulled item number nine. So um, is there any member of the public that would like to speak to item number 10? Item number 10, seeing none, I'll bring up back to the council for deliberation and action. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. motion by council member uh, Chase, second by council member Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously. Now we'll go to item number nine, and this is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for fiscal year 2019. So I'll turn it over to Amanda Rutella, or first of all, let me just say before you go, council member Crone, do you have a specific question or any question on this? No, I'd like to hear a presentation. Okay, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Amanda Rotella, Economic Development Coordinator. Yes. Um, <clears throat> oh. No, it's okay. Oh. Please, go, please continue. <laughs> um, so we just ha have a short presentation here for you today. So every year the Council approves the assessment. Um, this is money that the city collects as the fiscal agent for um, the downtown association. So twice a year we bill that out and we pass that money along to the downtown association um, to support their their mission of um, promoting businesses and, and creating a, a vibrant um, business environment in the downtown. So I do have uh, Chip here, executive director with the downtown association who can speak to um, the activities of the DTA. Um, but we, uh, this assessment happens every year and we, we get council approval for that um, to pass that money along. Thank you. So, uh, do you, do you have to one, do you continue with the presentation? I'll just say hello and, and uh, thank you for hearing this. We um, are excited about our work plan this year. We've been come off a very exciting year this past year we we kind of have wrapped up a, a really what was a three-year branding rebranding process for the downtown association i know you've seen our new look it's still new to us we're excited about it and this year a big uh, piece of our work plan was to launch our new website which we're very proud of and very happy with and also our work uh, collaborating with the city on bringing downtown streets team to town which we're very excited and proud of that uh, and coming up this year you'll see a number of items on our our uh, work plan, we're very focused on uh, beautification and placemaking projects that we're having some really interesting conversations about how to engage the community in placemaking downtown and creating events and positive experiences. We're also working on ambassador programs and, and creating a welcoming, exciting, and, and vibrant environment downtown. So I'm happy to answer any questions any of you have about the work plan, the budget, and our process, or anything else you might have. Council Member Crown. Yeah, that, that was what, what stuck out for me. I wouldn't, if you could say more about the ambassador program and that it's, it looks like in the budget, uh, I guess it's maybe item 11 too, but you're part of that. Um, is this replacing the um, Rangers uh, and how was that? decision made. Not functionally, no. It's not functionally replacing the Rangers. It's a very different service, a uh, very different focus. Um, uh, the funding uh, as item 11 uh, is related to that. To item. Yeah, this is part of our work but plan, so, so they're connected. 24,000 in there. 
Yeah, they are very much connected. And in fact, this is a, a contract the Downtown Association will be working with the DMC, the Downtown Management Corporation, on developing and creating an ambassador program. We will be retaining rangers in the downtown to continue their work of enforcement and working with the police department and downtown issues. Uh, the ambassador program we're working on is much more geared towards a, a hospitality focus, kind of looking at what we're, we've been doing with the information kiosk downtown, expanding that in an ambulatory way, really providing a welcoming experience downtown as well as yeah, uh, reporting a lot of the issues, graffiti maintenance issues that happen downtown to kind of help with the city services to spread, uh, to kind of focus how we can get support in different areas. So. Would it be any different than the um, downtown hosts program that used to be there? Uh, there'll be a lot of similarities to that, and I, I think we, you know there, there's we're learning from the successes of that program, and, and also how we can improve upon that. Uh, modeling this after a lot of other communities and a lot of other, other downtowns who have similar programs, uh, we're we're very excited as we're kind of building this program now. We're looking to launch in October of this year, so. Uh, but the, the the main focus is kind of, as I mentioned, really creating a, uh, you know, we all know how how magical downtown Santa Cruz is, so we really want to have ambassadors who express that and really are, you know, help people make coming downtown the best part of their day. So. Is it, would it be possible just to get a uh, sort of job description, what, what they'll be doing, because I really... I'm interested in that. Um, I, absolutely, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Councilman, we haven't completed that yet. We're yeah. doing a lot of work That's looking done. at, um, I just had a great conversation this morning with the Ambassador Program in Sacramento. We're talking to a lot of other programs, kind of taking best practices from all over the country uh, and talking to a lot of people. So we are developing that, and I'm absolutely happy to share that. And I look yeah. forward to it, because it's. I, I think it's a, a I miss the, uh, the yellow coats, you know, the downtown hosts. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, about placemaking, what is that? That's a really good question, um, and and that again, um, you know, we we've been having a number of conversations as with the mayor and, and others in the city around uh, the basic idea of placemaking is is creating very. Um, very interesting experiences for people in place, and it can be anything from, uh, you know, the, the parklets that the, the mayor was involved with creating downtown or, or uh, events or, or a variety of things. A lot of what our focus has been on is looking at, you know, perhaps temporary play structures or pop-up parks or various other activities. So it's a lot of what the, um, the, the Abbott Square has done, you know, and looking at how do we create experiences and support creating experiences for people people in the downtown that are place-based, community-driven, and, and exciting. So oh, I would love to see musicians included in that. I don't know how other council members feel, but, you know, just getting some, you know, support for them. I'm going to say I was going to hold over my questions on the Rangers and the hosts until item 11, but since it's, we're here and we have this discussion, I'll do it now. Um, why are you thinking of kind of rolling back um, in terms of support for the Ranger program? And, you know, what is the impetus of like going back to the, the host that we had looked at before? Just as background, sure. just so you can share with us. So, I can speak to that I'll just, too. I'd like to hear from the DTA. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, this was uh, the, the Downtown Management Corporation uh, has had a lot of really uh, substantive and, and kind of conversations about this over the years. Uh, we're absolutely not wanting to roll back in the, in the Rangers, in the enforcement. I think there is a, a it's a, a very much a valuable city service uh, and that we want to support the continuation of and the collaboration between the property owners, the business managers, the business owners and the city in terms of making sure that all of the services are provided downtown we need. Um, I, I feel like uh, we, we have had a number of conversations in the board of the Downtown Association feels very strongly that having a, a, a welcoming presence that's a, a very different function than the, the presence of enforcement, which cannot be understated, the importance of having an enforcement present, presence downtown, which both our police and our rangers provide that, but also having a, a, a more of a welcoming hospitality. Um, the rangers are, are spread very thin with what they're doing, and they're taxed, and, and they have a great service they do. So we're not, we're not looking to replace that. We're looking at, at creating a new program that works 
works in alignment with that. This program will not be successful without the support of the Rangers and, and the police downtown. Okay, and just as a follow-up, you had mentioned also the need to kind of prioritize some of the maintenance and activities, and I would think that having um, the host look at identifying like where are the areas that we can make better prioritize some of that maintenance might be one of their job description tasks. Is that what you're thinking too? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that, you know, we have we have great city services that we, we bring downtown and being able to really focus when and where those services are needed will be help help us all help the city and the downtown association the dmc be more uh, efficient with the limited resources that we all have so we, when we can as you kind of mentioned when we can identify this particular corner is being you know this trash cans overflowing having those eyes and ears on the street you know for example and I guess because I remember the, the prior host, just the last, last comment, is just how are you going to determine the success of whether or not, hey, you want to continue with it? And, you know, are you going to look back and say, that, is it the, the, the members, the downtown association members will kind of make a call at the end of the next fiscal year to say whether or not, hey, this program is working or? Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. We're we're working on putting together a, a survey now to kind of take the temperature of, of what is what is um, priorities in the district for the business owners and property owners, and we'll continue to assess that. You know, there's there's many many levels of and many types of metrics we can we can measure this by, and that's always a, a really good question to keep in mind. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll ask if there's any. If there's no other questions right now. I don't want to, can I ask this during item 11 then? Because um, I'm just one. I see a big, huge difference here. We paid 209,000 last year for the Ranger program, and that's going to go down to 104,000. Chip saying that that's not going to change. I'm wondering where this 105,000 bucks is going to come from in the meantime. I mean, if, if there's not going to be a different Ranger program, who, where's that? That's, that, I think that's a question that, that, I, that I was going to leave over to item 11 and ask about that, you know, how okay we're funding those programs. Um, and I mean, I think obviously this is the DTA budget. Let's, uh, let's uh, maybe hold that till 11 and take action on this so that we All can right. save it. So we'll take it to the um, public. If there's any uh, members of the public that would like to speak to this item regarding the downtown assessment. So item number nine. Sir, you have two minutes. Uh, Ed Silvera representing the Branson 40 Community District and also the Branson 40 Business Association. Regarding the Ranger issue, um, I think it should, uh, I, I obviously understand it's going to be discussed later on this evening, but to throw in the pot, I'd like to mention the Rangers cover downtown, but they don't cover our Branson 40 territory at all. And with a lack of police that are covering our one officer, where all the other officers are down here, we figure the Ranger program needs to be extended over to us as well. Being also that that a lot of discussion regarding the upcoming issue regarding the homeless facilities, uh, we're definitely going to need some more support with to assist the police department. So we would we would like this to be discussed and considered uh, seriously because we take this very seriously. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Is there any other member of the public that would like to speak to item nine? Please stand up to the, the, my left. Okay, sir. Yeah, uh, regarding the ambassador program, um, obviously part of their job will be that, whether they like it or not, they will encounter uh, what we would call street people uh, of a great variety. And uh, I'm sure the business community wants more official people from the city on the streets to mellow out various situations. Did I have a specific <clears throat> question? Uh, oh, that, that's, he's gone. <laughs> he's still here, I bet. Oh, you still but, but, here, but Chuck? Just, yeah, ask the question, sir. Yeah, uh, sure. The, the, the question is, what training equips a person to be an ambassador, and w what instructions will they be under to deal with people who are not shoppers, not regular tourist visitors, but are, in the opinion of some people, hanging around uh, or not being productive. You know, you know, street people or students, uh, you know, who, <laughs> what, what, what is the training? Is, what are the professional criteria for these ambassadors? 
Okay, thank you, sir. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak to this item? Okay, we're gonna bring it back to the council. And so I'll ask Chip the question that was just asked. What training will be provided to equip the person that is assigned as an ambassador and deal with the, the people that are currently uh, downtown that might not be there to shop? Uh, so we are we are working on uh, doing a, a lot of homework on best practices, working on developing some training programs that will inc include crisis intervention, that will include customer service, that will work with the police department and and others in the community. But we're we're building that training program and as comprehensively as we're able to. Uh, so it, the, I I imagine w we will have a very extensive training program for our hosts. I know the climate downtown. We want people to be supported. We want to make sure we have a really good crew. We have a pretty uh, in-depth training program for our kiosk crew who are are captive there, who who stay there all the time in terms of how to deal with certain situations and interface with different members of the community downtown. So we will. Uh, expand on that and, and provide as much training as we can. We're also open to any support and uh, recommendations anyone might have. So. Thank you. Okay, so we'll bring it to the, back to the council for discussion. Council yeah, I'm um, happy to go ahead and move the recommendation before us, which is to um, approve the plan uh, prepared and uh, adopt a resolution of intention to levy the um, downtown association um, assessments for 2019, et cetera. And I'll just say that um, this, um, we've, the discussion has focused particularly on the uh, evolution of the hospitality program here, but it's not being created out of whole cloth and we can deal with this um, when we get to item number 11. Um, the downtown host hospitality ranger program has evolved a lot uh, over the years since it was created. And um, this current iteration is um, the product of a, a really substantive and collaborative discussion between the Downtown Association and the Downtown Management Corporation. And I think we have a shared vision of what will be um, best uh, as a future direction, which includes both a flat out hospitality function and a, um, a more um, enforcement oriented um, uh, component, uh, both of which involve all the other partners involved in downtown, which include PD and the mental health worker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this result, this recommendation um, has been very well thought out by the partners. And um, so I've, I'm very confident recommending it. Yeah. I also serve on uh, the DMC or, or um, Downtown Management Corporation, and I was skeptical of this when I first saw it, but when we sat in meetings and we discussed it and discussed what the goals were, um, I did see um, a good reason for going forward like this. So I'd like to second the motion if I can. Thank you. So there's a motion by Council Member Matthew, second by Council M M uh, Member Naroyan. Um, is there any uh, further discussion on this? I, I just would like to know like what the, the issue that we're trying to fix, maybe from the folks on the downtown, I mean, what was the issue that came up that we need to like go to this ambassador program versus just keep the rangers in place? I, mean, I, I hope I'm explaining it well. Uh, basically that the rangers weren't fulfilling that downtown host um, function, which was where should I go to eat? Um, what type of food is good? Did I park in the right spot? And you know, just those general uh, information questions, especially by people who are from out of town, and also you know, you see Santa Cruz students who are new to the area or their families. So uh, it was to fulfill that kind of the positive sort of um, interaction that people would have with uh, with our downtown. And and frankly, just the difference of a uniform and a not not a uniform. It's it's um, and. Again, the discussion was very clear that both the hospitality and the enforcement capability were critical to one another. I'll, I'll hold uh, my comments for number 11 when we talk about the, the mm -hmm. coordination, but um, I'll, I'll support the motion. So w if there's no further discussion, we'll um, call the question. Oh. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, that motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to item 11. Um, this is the Cooperative Retail Management Business Real Property Improvement District Assessments. So uh, Economic Development Director Bonnie Lipscomb and Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Coordinator, please go ahead. 
Great. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, we're before you today to um, have a motion to approve the annual report and fiscal year 19 work plan, as well as a uh, resolution of intention to levy the real property business improvement a district for the Downtown Management Corporation. And Rebecca Unit, um, our business liaison, has prepared a brief staff report and presentation. And I will say a number of the questions that came up um, in the last item we were prepared to cover as part of this item. So hopefully we'll be able to answer any remaining outstanding questions. Um, I will say that historically we've had um, the uh, DMC assessment through the um, Downtown Management Corporation has funded a host program, an ambassador program. And we had a longstanding host program um, who, uh, and some of you may remember Gina Ramirez, and we went through um, SGI and had um, outside professional companies run the host program. And then we helped through economic development actually create Cali West, which was run by Gina Ramirez until she decided to sort of finished her master's and, and moved on. So we, for many years, benefited from having um, Gina and her expertise in the downtown. But we feel very confident that working with the Downtown Association, that they also have a lot of the same expertise that Gina developed over time and we can really help them um, provide through our sort of uh, relationship and uh, working relationship together between the downtown and the city have a successful host program. So we support that as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. David, if yes. I could. Uh, council Member uh, Matthews. Uh, not to steal your thunder, but just because there, uh, I know the council's aware of this, but for those in the audience, the Downtown Association is funded by an assessment on businesses and their primary goal is marketing and the Downtown Management Corporation is funded by the property owners and their function is on uh, more of creating a, a safe environment um, and being eyes and ears. So it does combine a little of the hospitality but definitely enforcement of the some of the issues that arise downtown. So one is assessed on businesses, one is assessed on property owners but they very much need to work together. I okay, to thank you. Clear. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks Please, for that Rebecca. clarification. Um, so uh, every year, it's just similar to the business improvement assessment. The city council approves this. Um, for the fiscal year 2018 and uh, report and fiscal year 2019 plan prepared by the DMC and approved at their board meeting on May 17th, um, there are no proposed changes to the CRM uh, assessment collection. Um, however, as you've noticed, the work plan is changing our funding from the Rangers to a new downtown ambassador program beginning in January 2019. Um, for the past two years, the DMC has provided funding for the downtown Ranger pilot program, which provided three Rangers, two full-time and one part-time. And the city contributed additional funding to provide an equivalent number of Rangers for a total of six or five full-time equivalent in the downtown. Uh, the pilot program was first enacted after Cali West decided to end their program um, after operating the downtown since 2012. Uh, the DMC board um, has been monitoring this program over the trial period and recognized that increased enforcement in the downtown through the ability of rangers to provide citations has been beneficial and they also, however, they also feel that it's still missing that friendly ambassador component that the DMC was originally formed to provide. The property owner and business owner representatives of the DMC Board of Directors recommended and the full board voted to reinstitute a downtown ambassador program effective January 2019. Um, the DMC will continue to contribute a portion of funding for the Ranger program from July 2018 through December 2018. And the funding will then um, shift to the downtown ambassador program beginning in 2019. The DMC will contract with Downtown Association to manage the ambassador program with the goals of encouraging a positive experience on the street, providing proactive assistance to visitors, observing and reporting antisocial and criminal behavior, and reporting and resolving vandalism, graffiti, waste, and cleanliness issues. The program will provide one operations director, two full-time ambassadors, and two part-time ambassadors. With Rangers moving over to the police department beginning in July, um, there will be more coordination between the Rangers and police in the downtown uh, to further support enforcement needs and come December 2018, the police department will need to assess if they'll continue um, with the Rangers funded by the DMC. Um, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Are there any council member questions before we bring it to the public and then we can come back still for deliberation and discussion? So my, my question would just, yes, be, council just, member just to be clear, um, that $105,000 that's in the budget that's um, the difference. So 
it's in July, it's gonna shift to the police department. If the police department wants to pick up that 105,000, then they'll do that. So the current rangers as they op are operating right now will continue at the same level until December. Um, they'll be moving into the police department, but that doesn't change how many rangers will be in the downtown um, until December, which is when that uh, financial piece will need to be. You know, I'm just wondering where the money's coming from. Or maybe oh, it's still Matt. coming from the Downtown Management Corporation and the equivalent funding from the city um, will then be coming from the police department's budget rather than Parks and Rec where it currently has been coming from. Do you want me to elaborate uh, on that? Yeah, city manager so, uh, Yes, so you know, the, for the first uh, six months, the police department is going to absorb the expense uh, within, within their budget. Um, as you know, the uh, beginning in, in July, the, the rangers will be shifted over to the police department. Not all the rangers, just the ones that are be that are focusing more on enforcement related in parks and that'll include the downtown rangers. Um, however, moving forward, what we will have to assess is the, the budget impact of that. I think in looking at the police department's budget and given the level of vacancies, we felt that we could proceed with uh, the, the initial six months to make this work. I think the general consensus is that the more uh, levels of support we have out on Pacific Avenue uh, with respect to having you know, the Rangers, with respect to having the host, that that would be uh, better overall. That is what uh, many communities have, a variety of different uh, uh, types of uh, individuals out there assisting customers, assisting people that are out there for a whole variety of reasons. The police department is also looking at a, at a volunteer program component to it as well. Um, so this, you know, it, this will have a potential financial impact uh, to the city, no doubt about that. Uh, we think we can get through the first six months and we'll then have to bring that back to you. Did answer your question? Councilman I, I just want to be clear that um, I support the program, the ambassador program, I think it's great. Um, and, and what, what uh, Councilmember Matthews said about uh, no uniform kind of thing, like the heaviness, you know, if you, you want to call it that, of the Rangers, even though it's not the PD, is that what we're trying to lessen? So are, are, are we gonna say that the Rangers are still gonna do the same patrols, et cetera, but the ambassadors are gonna be there too? Or are the ambassadors gonna pick up some of the, the slack or the, the stuff that the Rangers were doing and the Rangers were gonna be less of a, of a visible presence necessarily on Pacific Avenue? Councilman Matthews, can you answer that based on what the intent is from your participation? Uh, same number of people, Division of Labor. I think in, in a word. I'll say that I really support the Ranger program. I think it's been really a strong presence down there because they have a lot of different activities they do and they're actually down there and there's a presence there to help with certain emergencies that come up. I, I appreciate also that the, uh, the uh, Downtown Association is looking at ways to expand that. Um, I feel that one, the Rangers provide greater uh, connection with our parks and they provide a little bit more um, a response time that's quickly. I'm concerned that if we think about reducing um, the number of Rangers, let's say in December, what you'll have are hosts that have no one on the other line when they call when there's an issue downtown. And so you'll have a host presence and they'll be great in terms of identifying locations, but we won't have the necessary response to deal with some of the other issues that come up. So I just wanna say by supporting the, the, uh, the uh, DTA's kind of action here, I am um, equal um, supporter. I wanna see the Ranger program continue in this area and do not wanna see any sort of change in the really good work they're doing now. Agreed, and I just wanna emphasize again, the whole hospitality Ranger host endeavor has been a work in progress for <laughs> a long, long time. And, and I, this is one city function where I see almost more than any other, an ongoing look at how we do and how can we make it better with the resources available. So uh, I'm quite comfortable with that. And I think there's just a built-in desire to evaluate and morph it as necessary. It's DTA is making a proposal. I'm looking forward to seeing how this works, but I am also, as a city, I wanna make sure that we don't see any impacts to the Ranger Great. program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. All right, is there any, uh, we have any member of the public that would like to speak to this item? Please step up. This is, uh, this is item number uh, 11. Please, come on. Hi, my name's Jenny Marini. I'm one of the owners of Marini's Candies downtown. And I just wanna say that the downtown rangers 
are an amazing resource for us. Uh, I call them at least two or three times a week and they are there within minutes. We have a lot of people downtown that need help that I've tried to help before. And honestly, unless you have the training and these people know a familiar face, which they all know, the Rangers know all the people downtown that need help. They know them by name. They're there immediately when I call them. They calm these people down. They, they get them out of the business property, you know, I'm kind of emotional about it because it's a it's a very it's a resource that I don't want to lose. Uh, their phones were down for about a month, and I called 911 repeatedly, and never got a response from anyone. The Rangers are there within minutes, helping people, removing people, diffusing situations. And if the hosts mean that we possibly lose the Rangers, I don't think that that would be a benefit to our city. Um, I hear from locals all the time that they don't feel safe downtown and that they don't come down and support businesses. And I think taking away some of that presence would just make that situation worse. Um, so I, whatever the vote is that you keep these rangers, they're more important than a host, I think. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Is there any member? Any member of the public that would like to speak to item 11, please step up. Hello, my name is Susan Pappas and I'm the owner of the True Olive Connection downtown. Um, in the last 90 days, I've called 911 11 times for emergencies, violent tendencies. The Rangers came nine out of those 11 times. Without the Ranger program, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect my staff to feel safe, our employees to feel safe, our um, community to feel safe downtown. They're there every single time we need them. And they're the first people uh, boots on the ground. I really recommend that we keep the Rangers in full force, if not more, um, so that they are in places where no one else is. They do know their names, the people that are, um, that are tolerated downtown, look at them as a sense of force and they respect them. They immediately calm down when they see them. And it's important that we keep that level of uniform downtown. Our host program was amazing. And when we got rid of that one with that, um, when she retired, we all felt the loss of, of that group. But when the Rangers came in, we felt like we had a voice and they were listening to us. It's very important to keep that program. I would like to see all of those programs be successful and have all of the hosts and see somebody on Front Street and down um, at the Clock Tower and somebody down on Cedar Street and Chestnut and everybody welcoming all of the people to come downtown and feel safe and shop. But specifically after 7 p.m., we have nobody. We have nobody to help services, we have no rangers, and we don't feel safe after 7 p.m. And I think it's really important that we understand that there's also a time frame for these services and they cut off at night and then it becomes a 911 situation every time and those are services that are getting really exhausted. So I please appreciate the fact that we're all trying to help. Thank you. Thank you. Is, there any, is there any other member of the public that would like to speak to this item? This is item 11. Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the council for discussion and deliberation. Councilmember Matthews. Did I put a motion on the floor yet? Um, nobody has put one. This is now at the time. Yeah, okay. I'd like to move the recommendation before us and then make a comment as well. Okay, sir. Second? Second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Matthews, second by Councilmember Noroyan. I really value the um, first person comments from the merchants downtown. Extremely valuable. Um, and I think we all understand the structure of the um, policing organization has been undergoing some changes as well. And uh, one thing I would suggest, I don't necessarily need to put it in the motion, but I think we can just um, try and incorporate it at the Downtown Management Corporation and the DTA is do a quick check-in <laughs> after this goes into effect. Um, so we get, a, not wait for a year to see how it's going, but we really monitor it closely because, you know, we can make adjustments, but we think this is a, our best bet <laughs> for now. It, it's, a, it, it's a 
modification that makes sense, but I absolutely understand the issues that have been brought by the merchants downtown. And I also wanted to mention, uh, this is probably as good a time as any, the Downtown Association is holding its annual um, business community meeting and um, on May 23rd, Wednesday, May 23rd, um, which is tomorrow, um, they're actually having two meetings, one at 8.30 in the morning, 8.30 to 10, one in the uh, late afternoon or evening from 6 to 7.30, both of them at the food lounge. And the theme is going to be on safety and mental health um, issues in the downtown uh, with the idea of uh, what are the resources, um, what, what's the, um, the whole package of resources that are available to um, support our downtown and uh, what changes are happening, uh, bring people up to date on things they may not know. So if this is of interest to you, uh, it's the safety and mental health is the topic of the downtown business and property owners annual meeting. So tomorrow, either at 8.30 in the morning or at six in the afternoon, evening at the food lounge downtown. So it's something council members may be interested to know about as well. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Ryan. I just want to say that the discussions when this proposal was first brought forth, many of us expressed concern that the Rangers needed to still be downtown, not um, be reduced in their capacity. And we asked actually during the DMC meeting um, that within three months of this being implemented, mm -hmm. that a report come back to us. So we're really keeping close tabs on it. Obviously, we don't want the situation to become more negative. So we, we are keeping our eye on it. Okay, um, uh, City Manager Bernal. I, I just wanted to just uh, add a couple of items. One is the, it was brought up that uh, the concerns and issues related to um, just the, the number of individuals that have uh, mental health uh, uh, is issues or problems downtown is, is significant. And there is a, a, a renewed effort uh, with the county to provide a more quicker response uh, and support in, in that regard. Uh, they're rolling out a, a new program uh, and are making some presentations to the, the downtown association. And also we're working closely to do even even more than that. So we're having uh, some meetings with the county to really increase the responsiveness and the presence downtown. Uh, and that's really the idea to have as much uh, presence uh, and the ability to respond to all the various circumstances that come out. Because again, many of the issues aren't gonna be resolved uh, strictly by law enforcement. And, and again, to emphasize too that as we move forward, I think the consensus is that uh, you know it is advantageous and makes sense for us to have you know the rangers, the the host, uh, the volunteers, the mental health outreach, uh, but that will require you know it will be have an impact on the general fund, and so we'll have to figure out how to fund how to fund that moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to be clear about that. Thank you. I'll just say I I also appreciated the strong comments from the downtown business owners about the need to have a presence of our rangers down there. It's, I think it's imperative to have that presence, and if so long as we can supplement it with other ways to you know one create a more welcoming environment and to identify where we need to increase our maintenance and oversight of the downtown, all the better. But I think that for me, when we start looking at kind of this mix of services, you know, the rangers in my mind, I was there this morning and had them respond within two minutes to, to a call down there that was, you know, I think one that was creating a pretty strong disturbance. So I want to echo the comments that I heard from the business owners. And then I also like to say that um, for me, when you look at um, the programs you mentioned, I assume that those are county um, staff that are presenting the uh, mental health um, services that are available. I, I did not plan the program, I don't know. Okay. But I, I believe they'll be present. Yeah, because I was at a meeting, public meeting yesterday, and um, there are a variety of uh, resource numbers that I sometimes don't think are widely available to the public through either our city website or through the downtown association where you can email out to the members. So if CHIP or from the downtown association or the city staff has a website, we have a single downtown resource that has those direct numbers so that one, people know who to call when they have um, an emergency mental health response or some sort of county response again. I think it's really important that we kind of use the resources available, not just maybe rely on the, the host that you know might be coming or the, uh, them calling a city staff member to address something that maybe w might be addressed through um, other available resources as well. Okay, so uh, with that said, I think um, we'll uh, call a question. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, motion by Council Member Matthews, second by Council Member Naroyan. Please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion passes unanimously. So the next uh, item on our agenda is item number 12. It's the interim homeless facility planning update. 
And as a reminder, the um, order will be a staff presentation followed by questions of staff from the council. We'll then take public comment and then re return to the council for deliberation and action. And I see a lot of members of the public who are here that may be um, here to speak on this item. And I, I understand there was an email that was sent out by an official that kind of identified a particular location. The, the council is not looking at any location whatsoever. So if you're here to speak to a particular location, we're not gonna be discussing that. We are uh, aware that, that um, of all the emails and did see the email from the official that was sent to us that was actually surprising um, because it made, us, it made it appear that the council is taking action on something which we're not. There, the, the county uh, staff had been working to look at different locations and apparently there was a communication that was sent as a result of discussions that are totally unrelated to what the city is doing at this time. We are working with them closely in terms of finding a way, in fact, appreciate their um, stepping up to support some of these items that we're, we're discussing now. And um, we'll hope the staff can address that maybe now just to, to put it in context for those that are here to speak to uh, a particular location that was mentioned briefly before you um, go on to your presentation. I'll, leave, I'll ask uh, Assistant uh, City Mayor. Yeah, it was in the Sentinel, I know. I'll ask uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Tina Scholl to speak to that, who's been our lead negotiator on this discussion. Right, so thanks, Mayor Tarasas. Um, so for the council, well, for, for members the board, of the public. Um, I, I do think it, to make it clear that folks are here and that the council welcomes you and we would more than like to, I, I personally would like to hear what you have to say, so. Oh, I, 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 I in no way meant to discourage the public comment. I just want to provide you while you're waiting for this that that, that is an item that, it, that one, we're not taking action. Gotcha. So, uh, Assistant City Manager sure. Schultz. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, we know this has been a topic of really great enormous concern and uh, question and um, engagement with the, the greater community. And um, we are working with the county to identify potential sites. We are not recommending one for the council for the community to look at today. Uh, the presentation as you'll hear is really an update on how things are going. Because uh, you recall at your April 24th meeting, w there were some sites presented. There was a, a preferred site, if, if you will, for lack of a better term to explore and our community became, some members of our community became very engaged and very concerned about that. And so that was, as we worked through that, it became very, very clear to us. And that was a site that was had been used as a homeless shelter for about 20 years. And so it really was a, a sense that if we're gonna move forward with any site before we would put it forward, we'd be talking to the community. So that is our commitment to the community. Um, that is our commitment to the council. And this is where we know the council want to be as well. So I just wanna make that very clear. So we did not put this forward. And indeed, when we saw this communication, and we were very surprised, very surprised, because um, it didn't come from us. Um, so the site in question is the metro site right off, uh, the metro parking lot right off of the highway that had been suggested to us by the county, in fact, and we were just preliminary looking at it like we're looking at others, but we hadn't selected it. We hadn't gone far down that road of going forward with it. So mm -hmm. we did uh, get uh, a question for the media, and as you read in the newspaper, many of you, we said that you know we, we've looked at it in a very cursory way. We don't know if we can get site control. We don't know if we want to pursue it. So I just want to make that that clear. So so yes, it's been out there. Yes, it was in the paper, but it is. We are not recommending a site today. And then also, I just want to elaborate because when you use the the term "we," when you say "we," as, as, as that's city county, city yeah. County. So this mm -hmm. is not a you know when we think of this as a, a partnership. So that's where I just wanted to make sure when that was released, they are also looking at locations and inspecting them as well. It's really a partnership between the County of Santa Cruz, the city, and also the cities of Capitola and Scotts Valley for a North County partnership. So while the city and county are working on this very closely, so are the other cities as well. Okay, thank you for that. So I'd like to turn it over to Principal um, Management Analyst Susie O'Hara for the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Tarasas, and I'm pleased to be here to provide this update. Um, as Assistant City Manager Tina Schull mentioned, we really are focusing today on a progress update, and what I wanted to um, go over with the slides is um, we included in the staff report an, an, an update on operator solicitation 
program model, budget and funding model, as well as location and siting. What I wanna uh, focus on today is bringing us back to kind of the overarching values and guiding principles that we have been working under, kind of the compass that we have directed ourselves towards as we've walked through this process. As you can see by today's discussion and leading into today, to today's discussion, this has been a challenging process um, with a lot of wonderful opportunities as well as a lot of challenges. And I think as we move through the process, continuing to focus on those guiding principles and checking in on those often is going to be important for um, our council and our and our partnerships as well. So with the um, with the update, we'll be talking about the guiding principles, giving a progress update, as well as talking about next steps. So um, for the first section, the operator solicitation, uh, really the guiding principles under this area are we really intend, and this is the city and the county and the other jurisdictions as well, like Scotts Valley and Capitola, to not only contract with a nonprofit operator, but really focus deeply in conversation and dialogue with those that have experience with serving our homeless populations, running shelters, on developing a best practice model for our community. Um, we have been very successful in doing that. Um, we have a ton of interest um, with our nonprofit community as well as under, other partners in our community to help build uh, the model. And so we really wanted to have that engagement alongside of having ultimately a contractor run the, the program. So we also will be using the letters of interest that were submitted to compare and contrast staffing models, prepared budgets, services, and partnerships, and we're in the process of doing that now. So where, are we, where do we stand with the operator solicitation? We have received three letters of interest, all from very highly qualified applicants, so that's wonderful news. We're very pleased to report that. Um, not only is there strong interest in running the program, as I mentioned, but through um, looking at their LOIs, there's also a strong interest in engaging cooperatively among the government, nonprofit, faith, and business communities to build a successful model. So our intention around our guiding principles has been translated very effectively into those LOIs, and I think our nonprofit community has heard that and understands that. Um, this week, we're gonna take a deeper examination of the budget and staffing models um, to really understand what the costs are gonna be around this. We budgeted for the LOI, basically what we have budgeted on a monthly basis for the River Street Camp. That's a city-run operation, so when you translate that over to a nonprofit operator, you know, there's differences in costs, and so we're evaluating those now. So with regard to the program model, I really wanted to um, go back again over those guiding principles because I think it's important for the community to hear as we're thinking about citing this program, really what, how we plan on running it. So first, all, first of all, we plan on maintaining the River Street Camp program model. Um, in terms of neighborhood compatibility into phase two and phase three. With strong on-site and off-site security, shuttle service, no walk-on, walk-off, 24-hour staffing model. And so that's really um, a fundamental aspect of how we plan on ensuring that there's neighborhood compatibility with phase two and phase three. Maintain River Street Camp's low bar barrier to entry, pets, partners, and possessions welcomed. Um, those are some of the barriers that people face um, when entering into shelter, and so we wanna maintain as low barrier as possible as we can. And then increase shelter bed capacity from our current winter shelter and add day services. So um, what we've also heard from our uh, respondents to the LOI is that there is a need to phase in how many beds that we have just from the perspective of we're moving quickly, we have high expectations as to the program model and we really need to be working with them to phase in those, that bed capacity as well. So in terms of the budget and funding model, we do need to reach agreement with the Homeless Action Partnership jurisdiction, so that's the city, the county, as well as Scotts Valley and Capitola. Um, that year-round shelter is a priority for North County funding. Um, we expect that the funding model should be proportioned the same as the North County Winter Shelter, and you can see those proportions. The county at 51%, city at 35, Scotts Valley at seven, and Capitola at six. And then also actively seek local, um, state, private funding sources. I mentioned in the 
the staff report that there is good news at, a, at the state level, and that will be a big you know, aspect of our next steps is thinking about how to capitalize on that available funding. So progress update as it relates to the program model, budget, and funding model. With the three LOIs that we've received, the annual budget is estimated at approximately 1.3 million. So that's a number that um, we're still you know, actively looking at. There will be ongoing negotiations with uh, the respondents as well as who we end up selecting, but we think based on what we've heard um, from the LOIs that about 1.3 million is, is um, where we're gonna be at with the, the annual budget. Um, we took that information to the HAP Executive Committee last week, and we did reach agreement on a few things. One is on prioritizing year-round shelter from the HAP members, which um, staff was present. So we did hear from the city of Capitola, Scotts Valley, Watsonville, and, and from the county as well, that year-round shelter is a priority. Um, we had agreement to work towards the, the fun, uh, funding the year-round shelter and did very positively hear tentative budget support from the cities, um, and we're waiting for the county's commitment at this point. And then also, um, very soon, beginning evaluation of the governor's May revise to assess the funding pot potential, as I just mentioned, and beginning to dialogue with local partners, nonprofit, faith, business, on uh, local funding potential as well. So the guiding principles around the siting, I think we talked about briefly about this leading up to the presentation, but focus on sites with public control so we have more access and greater um, access in terms of being um, able to quickly turn around the project fully evaluate the site feasibility. So there's a lot of considerations that need to be taken into consideration as we think about whether a site is, is feasible, including the startup and preparation costs, infrastructure and utility requirements, and then the potential capacity of the site. Once we understand if a site is feasible, then we would go and conduct um, the community outreach and engagement to ensure that the, the questions around neighborhood compatibility are being addressed adequately. So um, in terms of a progress update, as of May 7th, Armory is unavailable. We've reported that out at the last meeting. Continue to evaluate feasibility of the other sites that we've al already identified and looking at other sites. Um, we you know, were aware of the Metro site through this recommendation from the county. Um, we had just very preliminary discussions as to feasibility. So we're, we're, we're at this point, we're not making a recommendation on any site today, as the mayor and, and Tina mentioned as well. So as far as next steps, um, and this is all happening with great haste, finalize the operator contract negotiations and budget, reach agreement with the HAP jurisdictions on the funding model, engage with our state representatives on the governor's budget. We are recommending that the mayor send a letter to support the governor's May revised budget to Brown and Assembly Member Stone as well as Sen Senator Monning. Just determine, fully determine the siting feasibility and options and then report back to you on June 12th with actionable items. And that's my presentation. Can you keep that back up, the yeah. recommendations? All right, any any questions at this time? You want to have discussion from the here public comment first, and then go to discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we do that? Thank you again for your patience. We're going to go to 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 you, the public, and have you speak first, and then we'll deliberate. So, um, uh, if you'd line up to my left, and ma'am, please begin. You have two minutes to speak. Can I just say something real so, quickly? Hold, hold on we one start? second. I just, just for the purposes of the discussion, and so Thank our discussion, so just for the purposes of discussion, and so our discussion is actually steeped in truth, as opposed to um, rumor that was started by a letter sent by a particular individual. I just want to state real quickly that the county staff was the one that suggested the park and ride site first not the city, that neither the county or the city staff had decided at this point to actually propose this site to either the council or the board of supervisors. So I just want people to know that before they speak. And of course, we want to hear all of you speak um, at, you know, at this time, but just keep that in mind, please, with your comments, because you know we are, I guess, just don't put us in, in your bullet sites. So to speak. <laughs> so. That's okay. Part, wait, name, wait, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just a brief. Um, I would love to hear also comments on um, 
you know, if we're going to have a homeless shelter that works in this in the city or county where if you have any ideas where that might be that I think the council would love to hear that as well. Okay, sorry for all that you know we're asking you now. You can tell us what you'd like, right? You don't have to On My next visit I'll bring a recommendation. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so please, you have 2 minutes. Okay, good afternoon council members, Mayor Trazis. My name is Kristen Marinovich, and this is my son Vigo and my son Nico, who with all due respect, I realize you're not considering locations right now, but they've left school early and uh, came and sat for almost two hours to experience city government and to have a, <laughs> oh. <laughs> have a say. Yes. <laughs> Good so you guys. Pause that for a <laughs> I have to I have to say that we are we live at 3061 Salisbury Drive. We share our back fence with the SoCal Park and Ride lot. The way things currently are, my boys don't leave the yard because of the unsavory foot and auto traffic that already go through our neighborhood. Uh, in the time that I've lived at 3061 Salisbury Drive, I've been under lockdown three times. Once you all remember the felon from the hospital. So um, I think three times is a little bit much in your neighborhood. Um, it's no secret that the gang activity in the Soquel Corridor right there where in our neighborhood has really increased lately. There's been quite a bit of um, really scary gang activity happening in that area. Um, to add to all these dangers that we're trying to raise our children in, in the city and county, to add um, that homeless element to our backyard would make our, our, just our own personal yard unsafe for my kids, you know, let alone going outside of the yard. Um, I know all of you probably, if you don't have children, you have children in your lives, and I would hope as we discuss this uh, issue further, and consider all the locations that you would consider how it would be to raise kids that are not safe even in their own yard when you share a back fence with a proposed uh, homeless facility. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are you are you going to be here for a moment? I'm going to. I have something I'll give to your two sons. We'd yeah. Love to stay. Okay. Okay. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Vinny Hansen. I'm a retired educator and author. Um, the proposed site at the park and ride, I think is a bad choice uh, because of its proximity to a number of schools. Uh, these are not city schools. Um, they are county schools. So I'm not really quite sure why the county uh, put this forward. Uh, this proposed site is 423 feet from a preschool. It's a two minute walk over the overpass of the freeway to reach uh, a service center for autistic children. You cross the street, you're at Green Acres Elementary School, which is actually a five campus school. It serves the Green Acres Elementary. It serves a charter school. It serves a preschool. It serves a homeschooling program and a Head Start. Um, and if a person walks down Soquel, it is probably an eight minute walk to Harbor High. So I do not feel this is a good location for a homeless shelter. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Dan Friedman. So I wanted to say that once you recommend a shelter site, I think it'll be too late. So I'm here to argue that the park and ride site is the wrong site for a homeless shelter. Uh, the, um, the Green Acre Elementary School campus, which was just spoken about, comprises of five schools, has open access to children's bathrooms, plenty of garbage and recycling bins readily available, and a huge playing field where homeless have already been found sleeping on occasion. Although the Google map shows it's 0.7 miles away from the park and ride, just walking, through, uh, walking across through a, a parking lot um, is less than a quarter mile away. Um, I also want to speak to the fact that uh, the um, park and ride site is under, and much of the surrounding area is under county jurisdiction. The county sheriff, which does not have the manpower on patrol per square mile that the Santa Cruz City Police have, the emergency response time will often be delayed for any problems stemming from a 24 7 homeless shelter at the park and ride. Um, make a note here. Um, so it seems to me, you know, that, um, oh, this is it. 
I wanted to say, like, is there any legal, you talk about the, any of these sites being temporary. Is there anything legally that would prevent you from extending it from the three year outer limit to another three years or 30 years? You say it's temporary, but what legal uh, reassurance do we have that it is, would be temporary if you pick the park and ride site? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. Uh, hi, I'm Jeffrey Ellis. I um, live in uh, Santa Cruz Gardens, which is the neighborhood just uh, east of uh, Prospect Heights in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. Uh, I'm really concerned about the consideration of the park and ride for uh, a homeless shelter. I, I think uh, in addition to the obvious, uh, the park and ride is used for parking and riding, for, for commuting, but... Um, Beyond that, it's only a couple of minutes walk from Dominican Oaks, which is uh, elderly housing and some of our most you know, vulnerable community members uh, live there. Uh, and, and to me, that, that makes the site uh, not, or a homeless shelter not compatible with, uh, with the neighborhood in addition to uh, other facilities uh, have already been discussed or, or in the uh, emails to council. Um, cooperation is great uh, between city and county. When, when I was at the county uh, this morning, I, I told them that this is county jurisdiction and this should not happen without public input to the county and a decision from the county government. And they all kind of nodded their heads like, yes, that's how it's gonna be. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand how city council could make this decision in itself, and, and I certainly hope you do not do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me let me just say that the city council won't make this on its own. So I appreciate that comment, though. Okay, hey, sir. Next speaker. Hey, you, if you'd speak to the microphone, please. Uh, my name is Kirby Wilkins. Uh, I taught oh, well over 30 years at Cabrillo College. Followed the whole development of Pogo Nip and I'm involved with a group of families building the community right at the base of uh, Pogo Nip. And we are naturally concerned about the future of Pogo Nip. So I was here to talk to that point, which sounds like it's not worth taking your time up with right now. But I, since I was here, I thought I would express the concern for what it would mean to Pogo Nip just as an open space if one of the proposals that came up several weeks ago was to use Pogo Nip. So I just wanted to be clear that there's considerable concern about a number of families trying to set up this community right at the very base of Pogo Nip, which involves a very diverse community of people, young people, adults, disabled folks, and others, and the um, organic garden, which will be very much part of Santa Cruz. So I just wanna say, I was here for Pogo Nip and I realize now that's inappropriate, but there it is. Uh, <laughs> And I guess everybody else is on the other subject here. Yeah, okay, thank you. What's on the same subject, sir? Next speaker, please. Hello there, my name is Chris Lewis. Um, I live near the Emmeline complex, um, and I'd like to talk about the Emmeline option, or not option as the case may be. Um, I'm here looking for representation. Council member Norian said, don't put, us, don't put us in your bullet sites. Well, who am I gonna talk to? Right, you're my city council, I need you. Right, my daughter needs you. My daughter is three and a half. She's learning to ride her bicycle, right? She has to, she has been pedaling around people visiting the methadone clinic, right? I want her, I want those people to get methadone, right? I'm not saying that. But the MLI area is already impacted, right? I'm not talking about nimbyism. I'm saying that we're taking our share of the load, right? We're already doing it, right? Um, Vice Mayor Watkins said, I, I'm pulling for the children earlier, right? Who's pulling for my daughter, right? She shouldn't have to be told by me what a used needle looks like or what human feces looks like and to pedal around it on her bicycle. That's not a place to grow up. Councilmember Cronin asked, well, where could it be? And the answer is any not residential district, right? It's very simple. <laughs> We have, 
we have industrially zoned areas in the county. That is where this should go. It is not a case of distance. If we are gonna bus people to and from, then distance is not the deciding factor, right? We have industrial areas. It does not need to be in a residential area where families and children grow, right? These are the people that will look to you for representation, right? These are the people of Santa Cruz, right? And I know the time is going down, but my daughter is worth longer than two minutes, right? I will not, I, I just, how do I explain this to her? Like this, this almost abdication of responsibility that I read in the newspaper, I know, that, that says, oh, you know, um, we just have bad options, we just have bad options, so we're just gonna have to pick a bad option, right? That's not something I can tell my daughter. You can, right. you can continue and wrap it up. Thank please. you. Right? There are bad options because all I've seen are bad options, right? But it doesn't mean you have to pick one on an arbitrary timeline, right? That's made up by the council. It doesn't have to happen on the timeline that's being suggested, right? There are industrial zones. Use them, please. And please, city council, I know that it's not just you, but please represent me and represent the people that voted for you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Aid. <laughs> Can you put it on the overhead? So this morning, instead of going to work in my busy downtown shop, I spent some time on Google Maps trying to explain. My name is Susan Pappas, and I happen to live at um, on Salisbury Drive. My 10-foot fence, which I built myself to get people from coming and jumping over my fence to play with my dogs during the day, butts up to the SoCal Park and Ride. So that little yellow line that I have on your handout is my fence, their fence, their fence, and their fence that all have small children, a surgery center, a six complex with babies in it, a daycare center, and 30 houses, 10 of which have children under 10. There is no road access other than to fall into the area of the green area. Um, the only access that people have is to either run into the bushes or get on the freeway if they're trying to escape, which has happened how many times have we been on lockdown? We happen to have all of the, we have private road, no road maintenance, no police service. Um, we call daily over all the, um, the um, um, RVs that are parked on our street that are illegally parked there every day because there's no police activity to come and call them off. And we have a, all kinds of reasons why we're in such a small neighborhood that doesn't get any support now to have them just because it's a convenient parking lot that is owned by the county doesn't mean you could just drop and place people that need services that we don't even have now in our community. We don't have health care services that are needed, mental health, it's everywhere. And I call up Joan. Come here, Joan. Well, she, okay. Joan is a widow who lives next to me who lost her husband to a gunshot because the son and mother did not get services that were needed for mental health. So the widow is on the street looking at the yellow line at the end. That would be her house next to my house that is unsupported by any structure other than woods, open woods that we call weekly for encampments. She's worried about her house burning down, she already lost her husband because of services that weren't available to county people. We can't see this happen again. Our neighborhood is broken enough. We will not tolerate this in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood says no. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name's Andy Werner. I've uh, lived in the, this neighborhood since 1973. I've seen a lot of changes, including the park and ride being built, which is no longer used as a park and ride, but a lot of people park there. And if you just eliminate the parking, uh, that's gonna create some problems. One of the reasons uh, it would is because Dominican Hospital, which is the biggest employer in the area, doesn't have enough parking for its people. Right now they're contracting with a graveyard to have actual parking light in the graveyard, Oakwood Cemetery, for their personnel. And, and I know they've been negotiating with the transit district to see if they might uh, purchase parking spaces or rent them in the park and ride. But that aside, it's just a very bad location for it. 
I personally have a, a wife who's disabled from a stroke. I still work part time and I'm not always around and she's kind of fearful. Uh, she'd be totally helpless against somebody who would break in. We already have uh, transients coming there. Some, in some cases RVs, in some cases they've actually cut the fence and uh, gone down in the bushes. I have called the sheriff many, many times because of that reason. And in other words, we're already impacted and this would be much more of an impact. And I'm also wondering, okay, the people are here in, in that location, where are they gonna go? They're miles away from any services that they would utilize. Uh, probably a couple miles from downtown Santa Cruz. If they choose to take the bus, I, I, I don't think all of them will be on the shuttle. Some of them will try to come by bike, by bus, and it's really a heck of a, an intersection. I don't know if you guys probably live in the city of Santa Cruz, you know River Street and, uh, and Highway 1. This is actually more complex, but it, it gets terrible gridlock at certain times of the day. Cops aren't gonna be able to get there. Ambulances aren't gonna be able to get there. Well, Dominican's right there. They, they probably could walk him to the emergency room, but it's just a, a place that offers nothing for these people. They're gonna have to go far away and they're gonna try to come. And it's a little bit difficult to find the entrance to the park and ride. And I can foresee them walking through the neighborhood like people do even now. Uh, and uh, again, I go with my neighbors totally against this. And I hope uh, the county will listen too. Thank you. Can we get the next speaker, please? Good afternoon, Council. My name is Mike Pappas, co-owner of uh, Trail of Connection, better known as Susan's husband. <laughs> Most of you probably saw my wonderful email this morning. Uh, it was not meant in any disrespect whatsoever, but it was meant to be direct, and that is usually how I deal with situations. My backyard does back up to the park and right. When I said that the sheriff is probably answering the phone, hello, Mike, I wasn't joking. I do call two, three times a week. Andy and I are pretty much the sheriffs around town. My last stop before I go into my driveway is through the park and ride. I check the chain link fence. You'll see the back boards have all been replaced. I've been uh, strengthening them with two by sixes, two by twelves, metal studs. They constantly come through. They kick the boards out. They cut the fence. I'm picking up trash left and right. Not the right location, guys. I don't have your solution. I wish I did. I don't know what to tell you on that part, but we know that this is not the location for us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <coughs> Hi, my name is Christina Moretto, and I am co-owner of a property that butts up against the Poganib. And uh, this is a property where my son, who is developmentally disabled, is going to be living. Um, my concern about having an encampment in this area mm -hmm. is number one, there is only one way to get to it, and it's a tiny little road um, that goes right up past our property. Um, our fences are right up against it, so that, you know we're concerned with the vulnerable population, um, you know, being in danger, frankly. And um, you know, I'm very sensitive to the homeless situation, and understand that I think that there are a lot of like people who need places to stay and are willing to abide by the rules, but that this encampment will actually draw other people who are do you know who are going to be more involved in drugs and maybe more violent. Um, so that uh, really is a primary concern of ours. And that um, there was a report that stated that there are no neighbors um, uh, that go up against the Poganib. Well, we're the neighbors, so there are people that live there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, Kevin Herbst, I'm the managing director for Chaminade Resort and Spa. I'll pass on the redundancy here. Um, you've heard it, I would just, I've always told my staff and people around me, my children, come with solutions. So it's all been said already, not a great location, economic impact, other impact to the area. Um, thank you for your stewardship of the community. Um, I'm the steward of a 200 acre, par acre parcel off of Paul Suite. I already deal with the program and the problems. Um, call upon me for help in uh, finalizing this and whatever I can do for you and whatever Shaman I can do for the community. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, next speaker, please. 
Hello, uh, my name is Susan Geip and I've been a resident of this county for 40 years <clears throat> and I'm here to d deeply implore you not to consider Pogo Nip as, one, as the temporary location. Um, I've hiked there for 30 years. In the last 20 years, I hike there weekly and my main concern is fire danger. Last August, a friend of mine and I were hiking in Pogo Nip and we saw smoke in the distance and we went over and it, there was a homeless camp. It looked like it had been abandoned that morning and a fire had not been put out and it was going out into the grasses and small trees and it was really frightening. And I called 911 and the fire department came. But in my opinion, Pogo Nip is a jewel and a treasure. It's a very sensitive ecological system. And I've talked to the rangers over a number of years and they've done tons of work in trying to weed out illegal homeless camps. And I've, we've seen huge bags, black garbage bags of trash that are waiting to be hauled out. And we've, when we've come across the camps, there's been a lot of debris, clothing, metal, bark pipe, bike parts. Um, and um, I just think it would be a tragedy to lose and compromise Pogo Nip because it's just such a beautiful ecological environment. And um, personally, as a single woman, I hike with a friend there a lot, but I, I, I don't feel safe hiking alone. I've seen some of the people coming out of homeless camps that f really scare me. And I've heard they go back there and do drugs and deal drugs. And uh, one guy had a big pit bull that totally frightened me. So I, I um, agree with the gentleman who encouraged you to consider um, industrial parks, uh, industrial, uh, not parks, but industrial properties for the camp and I have great sympathy for all the people who ha have neighborhoods are in neighborhoods close to the park and ride and um, so anyway I really ask you not to consider our jewel and our treasure of Pogo Nip. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker please. Good afternoon uh, my name is Jessica and I live at 3115 Paul Sweet Road which is one of the three houses actually on Paul Suite on the park and ride side of the graveyard. And it wasn't uh, more than a handful of years ago that before on the graveyard, there was no parking overnight signs. I believe the Chaminade was actually partially responsible for getting those um, no overnight parking. Before those signs were, we basically had a homeless camp up and down that street. Um, RVs, campers, camper vans, abandoned vehicles all the time and they would encroach up into my house. Now, for my job, I get home several nights a week after one in the morning. There's no lighting on that street, and when I would get out of my car, there were several times that I was approached by people. It's terrifying. My, I do have security cameras, but they don't come on until you get to a certain amount. So then I started arming myself with two mace cans every time I got out of my car. When those uh, no overnight parking signs went up, the problem, a lot of it went away. It's not great, but it's night and day to what it was before. And I'm just terrified that I'm gonna have those problems again and be terrified to get out of my car when I get home from work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public other than those who are standing that like to speak to this item? If you just stand to your left, just so I know, Count, sir, you're, you can begin. Hi, I'm Doug Wilson. I live on Salisbury. <clears throat> and I'm totally opposed to having a camp in our area. Um, I've looked at the map and there are lots of areas um, uh, below um, off Club Drive, out in the open, about a mile from where the current um, homeless shelter is on Costco, near Costco. When I drive by there and look at the trash and the junk, I just don't want that in my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Teresa Souvigny, and um, I'm one of the owners of 335 Golf Club Drive. This is my daughter, Hannah. Hannah will be living there eventually, and our property is on that small little road that leads up to the Poganip, and our farm uses the water from the creek that runs through that area for our organic farm. I am all for services for the homeless, but I believe moving a large number of people to live in the Poganip would be an environmental disaster. It's a beautiful nature area, people have said. 
It's enjoyed by the entire community, including hikers, bikers, UC Santa Cruz students and faculty, and of course, the wild animals and birds. It's my understanding the city has focused many resources in the past cleaning it up. Uh, I've read an article several years ago, tons of garbage was removed and has really um, cleaned it up so it could be the wonderful refuge it is today. So I urge you as you're looking at your options to make sure you understand that the Poganip is a, a jewel and um, I, I just think it would be a disaster. I'm worried about the fire danger. My daughter's gonna be living the little road that dead ends to the Poganip, which I believe is the only entrance to it. Um, I also saw an online document that Christina referred to earlier saying the pros and cons of the four areas and under Poganip it said there were no neighbors. So I believe somebody asked that that be changed. I don't know if it's been done, but um, we have a family living there right now and we'll be building houses with um, to serve our developmentally disabled kids. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name's Jim Latore, and for the last 15 or so years, my wife Kathy has run the Secret Garden Preschool, which is the preschool there in the area. Um, I don't wanna, um, I, I mean, you certainly have heard enough um, conversation about how inappropriate it is, but I would hope that you guys would consider when and if you were, were to consider an area for a homeless shelter, that you would certainly take uh, into consideration all of the things that are already mentioned, along with certainly our concern of 57 families and 13 employees, um, so I, um, I have all the confidence in the world in you uh, understanding the, the nature of the issue. I am sympathetic to the homeless situation in our town. I, I, I hope that you guys can do something about that. Um, and I, um, I wish you the best of luck, but make sure you consider everything that you can um, when determining a, a, a place for your, your um, work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, council members. My name is Jason Booth. I live at 435 Demia Lane. We've spoke before. I didn't plan to speak today. I just planned on watching, but uh, Chris Crone uh, mentioned uh, talking about different possibilities and needs to say, uh, driving around town, I have my eye open for different <laughs> places that might be an option. I don't know if these have any possibility, but I thought I'd mention them because uh, we only have so many eyes in the community. Uh, there's a place that's, uh, directly adjacent to Santa Cruz Gymnastics. I think that's off of, oh man, you'll have to look it up. But uh, there's a fenced area there that looks like it's totally not being used, obviously owned by somebody. But uh, it's, a, it's a fairly large size area that's fenced off. That might be something to look at. There's also an area in Almar, which would probably upset a lot of people. So off of Almar, uh, but it's a triangle right next to the uh, railroad tracks that is not occupied but something to consider. Uh, again, that, that one might cause some issues. Um, also, uh, I don't know if council members have gotten the videos and things and letters that we've sent in uh, from our road, but definitely would be worth taking a look at. Um, the gentleman that was talking earlier about it being, uh, looking at commercial areas, I hope he wasn't speaking of our neighborhood. Uh, our neighborhood is commercial ag, but it's generally agricultural and very, very residential. So uh, looking at the zoning uh, by itself would be a mistake in that our neighborhood is very, very family tied, very, very uh, community structured. And I hope you take that into consideration when it comes to the point of making a decision. I know that you guys are in a very, very difficult position and you have a lot of things to look at, but uh, please do consider us when you think about it along with everybody else that's been speaking today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Um, I am also a resident on DeMeo Lane. Um, our street has um, hardworking families, tons of children. I spoke at your last meeting giving many reasons why DeMeo Lane is a bad choice for this because of the families, the children, the detouring tourists from Wilder Ranch, the extreme weather, the far proximity of town, the mountain lions. I wasn't able to touch on the fact that there is a family that was directly on the property of the proposed property. Um, there are two hardworking parents with two school-aged children. What will happen to them and where will they go? Um, you need to find a place away from all of the Santa Cruz County residents or drop the program altogether. 
You will be bringing the homeless into whatever location you recommend and whatever problems result will be on your shoulders. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Christina Lupano and I live in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I don't think any neighbor should actually share the burden of a homeless camp. I still need to understand how this council has come to a conclusion that we have to have a homeless camp. First of all, there was an example that I believe 15 years ago Santa Cruz had done, had opened an homeless camp that be became like a tragedy afterwards. I think I was in one of these meetings before and I'm not sure who has mentioned the first uh, homeless camp that was opened 15 years ago and then it kind of turned into a nightmare and the police couldn't even go in and clean it and keep it under control. So I'm not really sure why this is, has become a decision. Second of all, um, I saw some of the numbers. I don't wanna talk about location because apparently location is not on the agenda today. But I saw some of the numbers on the slides that said that um, it would cost, as operation cost, would cost like $1.3 million a year. Does that include emergency call and um, you know sheriff and police and uh, firefighting and uh, Dominican hospital with their emergency coming in and removing people and taking people into the hospital and things like that. Cause $1.3 million to run a shelter for a hundred and plus pe 50 plus people. It sounds like it's not enough, honestly. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, um, you know, there's been also um, other community in the United States like Seattle or Portland that has started a homeless shelter in their cities. Did any of these studies were review and understood, why do we think that we can actually keep it under control? I think it's Seattle right now who has an, a huge problem with the homeless shelter that they open. Why do we think that we can do better in Santa Cruz? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, please. Ed Silvera. I want to make a, a comment that the, the last speaker, we definitely support what she said. Actually, it should really be focused. There was significant discussion there. I'm Ed Silvera representing Friends of De La Viega and the surrounding residents of De La Viega Park. Now I know we're hearing for now, De La Viega is not being considered, but we're not going for that. We find it interesting that the National Guard is in the process and letting you know that they're building buildings and talking and asking around with the planning department and, and everywhere. No one seems to have an interest about what are these buildings are gonna build? Are they gonna build golf course houses up there with their surplus land across the street? This council has no interest on what they're gonna be building up there or why in the middle of a city park. Well, we're requesting that this council look into it. City manager too, when he gets around to it. The point is, we have a serious concern regarding this not for now up in De La Viega Park. And we don't, we don't really care about hearing that for years they bust people up there in the winter time when it was cold. Well. What it comes down to is what it did, it directed a lot of people They didn't want to get up at six in the morning in the cold. And they made that park their little center in a situation and, and having it more of an impact isn't gonna help its situation, especially with fires. And we were overwhelmed with, with stacked up debris up in that park, trees crisscrossed, not enough money for the fire department to deal with the issue. And we think that it's time that there's put some energy, there's been some, needs to be some energy to clear up the park for more fire issues from homeless encampments. It's already started fires and one at the National Guard itself, which has cleared some land recently, about five acres. We're taking this very seriously and we'd like to thank you too, especially members that we voted for in the Branson 40 area that doesn't seem to really give a damn. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Rawlings and I live over on Salisbury Drive. I'll echo some of the comments, most all the comments that my neighbors have made, but uh, a couple of reasons why I think 
a terrible idea to put a, put a, a shelter in that area is in part, uh, the, the infrastructure of that, of that community is um, so inferior. I've just uh, di diverted a sewer lateral, for example. The sewage system there is 70 years old. It was installed in 1943. It's not designed for the type of commercial um, uh, workload that's gonna, that's gonna hit it were there to be hundreds of people living nearby. Uh, suggestion, I think, paving, lighting, uh, the ability to, uh, for people to, uh, the lack of roads is, is a, a problem. The ability of people to, as, as, quote unquote, escape on foot um, is real. Maurice Ainsworth comes to mind. He was able to escape from law enforcement for hours before emerging on English Drive uh, with a standoff for six hours. Uh, you can just, that Arana Gulch area is just prone for people jumping into. Uh, I'm concerned I have two small children that live there. Suggestions for other ideas. I think there needs to be some sort of law enforcement presence nearby. 17th Avenue has a substation. Performance Food Services is leaving. There's a huge warehouse complex with a massive transportation area that can, uh, how, that would be a, a large open space for people. Uh, if we're talking about DeMeo Lane, what about Roundtree? On the other side of town, um, where there's a, where there's the uh, the county facility with law enforcement, uh, there are many other options. They just shut down the bus stop uh, at the surgery center at Paul Sweet Road. I think it's still available for the 17 Express, but it's not available for uh, the local transportation. So there's going to be a bunch of people there that would be isolated, and I think it would be a terrible. Um, uh, a location to consider the Salisbury Drive, but thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Council. I was here uh, a couple of meetings ago to talk about uh, Emmeline Drive, and um, I guess because something was in the paper, that's kind of dropped off the radar, but here I am back again. Um, I wanted to mention the Goodwill Bargain Barn building, which has recently been vacated. Uh, it's a pretty big building and uh, has some large parking structure uh, area around it. So if you're looking for alternate sites, I don't know if it's, I, I suppose it is Goodwill property. Uh, but if you're looking for um, partners, they, they seem that they would be compassionate. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is during the uh, presentation, it says return on June 7th with actionable options. But before that, you mentioned wanting to partner with the community that may be involved and get their buy-in and take time to discuss. You know, it's it's May 22nd. <laughs> I don't know how much buy-in and talking and uh, cooperation you can get from any community <coughs> site you choose in three weeks. And I, I guess I'm, I'm confused as to why this is moving so quickly. It seems to be moving quicker than our ability to slow down and, and take some time and look for, you know, it's like looking for a house. You can buy a house tomorrow. <laughs> it may end up being the wrong house. So if you take more time and look around and, you know, look at many houses, you find the house that works for you. And I, I just hope you guys possibly, I don't know what the rush is exactly. If, if River Street has to be closed or if it's a budget situation, is there an answer there? Does anybody know why it's if you pause for a second, we'll, we'll answer that question. I've, I've been writing some of these questions. Okay, down, so great. Back to you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Serge Cagno. Uh, I'm not going to speak to which site you're going to choose. Um, the, I was one of the respondents for the letter of uh, interest. Um, I hear what everyone's saying that safety for children and absolutely, I think that that's my goal. And you know, the whoever does the the program uh, that has to be the safety of children is number one. Um, I've run a lot of different programs, and meeting the neighbors and them having my cell phone number is just part of how you do business. Um, it's people need whatever their needs are; they need to be addressed. You know that you have to answer to a lot of people too. Um, I think being creative and having a lot of uh, collaboration will be able to answer uh, different, all, everybody's needs as much as possible. That just doing the shelter doesn't mean it needs to be an unsafe neighborhood. You know, I don't think those are equatable things. Um, I'm more about numbers and about, you know, the talking about schools and unsafe schools and stuff like that. Like 
there there is a family shelter that's over on Coral Street too. Like they do go together, kids and homeless people, like they interact. Um, there are groups of people that are criminals and there are groups of people that have substance use and mental health and all that and you still have to make plans to be able to deal with that. The uh, talking about running buses in and out so that the the neighborhood's not impacted, well, that that's the plan for the thing. And the question to the neighbors of the River Street is how impacted have they been? I've heard that they have not been impacted. So I definitely hear that safety should be number one. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I don't think a shelter makes safety not possible. I thank you, next speaker. My name is Linda Weaver, and um, I wanna thank you for, for trying to find the solution, at least part of it. Comes in pieces, I think. I was a volunteer at the winter shelter program, and I know for a fact that when that closed, people were put back onto the streets or in the parks. People who were making progress because they were getting support, because they were getting services, uh, have deteriorated. I know that for a fact. So um, I just encourage you to, um, I encourage you to um, move forward diligently. I hear all of the concerns, um, but to also know that uh, a lot of this is a mental health. Um, it, there just has to be some sort of solution. Um, I wanted to ask you whether um, you were looking into the state funding for perhaps shared housing. Um, maybe part of the problem is um, looking at it as, as such a large um, facility. In the old days, back in the 70s, they used to have shared housing for folks that needed supportive services. And I don't know whether any of the money that's coming from Sacramento or anywhere else could be used for that, but I would encourage you to look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Are you here to speak to item number 12, sir? Speaker number 12. I'm just no, are you here to speak to item number 12? We're on oh. item number 12. We're not on public comment yet. I understand that. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, please, you have two minutes. Yeah, my name is Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. Um, with regard to the homeless, I've, um, I have compassion for them, but I also feel like um, some expectations have to be put on them. I spend a lot of time uh, dealing with removing non-native vegetation in the local wildlands, and I see stuff that um, is so disgusting and you want to puke, frankly. It's utterly disgusting. And what, I mean, it's bad enough just on a city street where anytime you see a bunch of homeless people, there's going to be a lot of trash in their wake. It, is it asking too much for these people? I'm speaking right now to anybody that's watching me who is a homeless advocate or a homeless person who wants to be helped. You've got to do something for yourself. And picking up after your trash is certainly the rock bottom bare minimum that you can do for yourself. And you shouldn't be asking anything from anybody else until you can at least pick up your own trash. That's not asking too much. Uh, you, you know what? You know you can, unfortunately. You could write it down and pass it, you know, pass it through us, but we've, you've already commented, unfortunately, okay? But we'll be available, send an email if you'd like, and we'll review it. Um, are there any members of the public that would like to speak to item number 12? Anyone who hasn't spoken already? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna bring it back to the council. There was a couple questions that I wrote down. Maybe I'll put those out first. Um, one gentleman asked if a site is uh, identified, can it be extended beyond the recommended uh, temporary period or would there be some additional permitting required? So like if, we, uh, if once a site is identified, can you um, automatically extend it even further uh, without any sort of additional process? Uh, so permitting is really site specific um, and I, I would not be able to address that based on, you know, generally speaking. But from the perspective of the declaration of the shelter crisis that the council took a few months back, you know, that we do have some leeway with permitting, especially around a temporary facility. So I think um, the intention though around the phasing is to ensure that each phase, and you know, that's 
part of, of the reason why we're bringing this and having you know some urgency around this is we are hoping and fully expect to maintain those time frame promises that we make to the community. So as it relates to phase two, we would expect to have that open only into only until we um, build and start to operate phase three. No, and those again are um, our commitments that, that we've kind of discussed that. Do we have, do we know that those are the same commitments that are shared by the county as well for the same timelines? Well, I think generally speaking, the commitment that we're trying to make together is to implement the permanent shelter and how we phase um, moving into that um, really depends on the site that's available and being able to find the operator and, and also having the budget available. Thanks. So I, I would just say that if anything was, were to be selected and there's a, a time period that's identified, um, if it were to be extended, I guarantee it would come back to the council before it's done. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be something that would be arbitrarily extended. So there would be a, a process that would happen um, to answer that question. The second one was, is there is it a budget question regarding continuing the use of the River Street shelter? And I'll ask the city manager that. The, the challenge with respect to the, the the current shelter facility, and I think I think there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, about what we're talking about because I think people uh, probably picture the homeless shelter on Coral Street is what they envision is what's being proposed to be moved, and, and that's just not the what what is being proposed to be moved. The, the the current River Street shelter is a completely new model. It's it's completely different. Then, then, uh, and also so, so some of the members of the public pointed to some some encampments that happened years and years ago, which yes had had serious problems. So, so that's not what is 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 being uh, envisioned. No, let me just say the question was: Is it a budget question regarding continuing the River Street Shelter? Right. So, yes. So, with respect to the River Street Shelter, which again is uh, a different operating model. Uh, the the issue with that is that a couple of things. One is that the city alone cannot fund. A, it's a regional, it's a regional shelter facility for the entire region. It happens to be in Santa Cruz, but this is the city. The this is the region's the shelter facility, and Santa Cruz hosts these regional services right now. Um, and at the cost that it's operating, it's not cost effective. It is a lot of money for a small level of capacity. And we have, you know, a couple of thousand homeless individuals in our county and about 300 shelter beds. And so part of the goal here is to increase shelter capacity so that we have fewer people, as many people pointed out, who are, who are uh, out uh, in, in encampments and already creating a lots of public safety and public health uh, uh, issue. So the idea is to increase capacity so we can uh, reduce that impact on, on the community and also at the same time assist individuals to perhaps get getting out of homelessness. So, so the question, it would be yes, there, were, there is an, a, there, there is a, to answer the question, is there a budget question regarding it? Yes, there, there, there is, it is a yes. budget question. You can't just continue without right, right. extending. Okay, just want to make sure that was clear. Um, I, I'm going to, I just want to say something. I, I wrote something out and I just want to bring it up because I think it's critical right now. We've had this, these discussions, um, and as we've heard over many months, um, and through the recommendations of the Homeless Coordin Coordinating Committee, I don't think there's any uh, escaping a required regional response to address the need for emergency, emergency shelter at this time. And I'm proud of the city efforts that have engaged uh, partner agencies in this. I think um, Susie O'Hara has kind of really taken a lead in this, as well as all the other city staff that have gone out there and kind of set something up to move this forward, as well as the city staff and actions to really try something new. I mean, I think this is just really, we, we were at a place where we could not continue operating the same way with some of the impacts we're uh, experiencing downtown and throughout our city. We are now at a critical, critical point in time where a firm public commitment by our partners is required if our region is to continue to make progress um, to address this uh, mental health challenges in our downtown, to address homelessness and the actions by some who have overburdened our public safety and park staff here in the city. We have critical decisions to make as a region about where we go from here, and this will require a strong commitment to address these challenges through the funding of a cost and operationally effective interim shelter. If we are to 
to proceed, in addition to the next steps, recommendations that are here, I would ask the council to authorize um, me to draft a correspondence on, on our, the council's behalf to our county partners to confirm their support for increasing emergency shelter capacity on a year-round basis as outlined in the report by staff and requesting their support both res respect to the contribution, contributing a fair share of funding and to collaborate and make a recommendation with respect to the site evaluation and decision-making process. I would ask that we get a response by mid-June so that city staff can formulate decisions about the fate of the River Street Camp um, and also to ensure our own budget solvency in terms of how we've taken uh, this on and really looking for some long-term solutions that are sustainable. In my opinion, with a regional commitment, our county and city can make a determination about the status of the River Street Camp and how it might trans transition towards a cost and an operationally effective facility with the full support of partner agencies. Um, without it, I think we're in a position where we have to decide where we want to go from here. And so for me, the recommendations that are there are, are, um, are good ones, but I think we also need to get a little bit more clarity as far as the, the level of our partnership, as I mentioned through some sort of um, communication that's authorized through our discussions here. Um, I do like the uh, outreach in terms of uh, to the governor and elected officials, and I, and I know we had action on this earlier in the year to have some sort of um, public outreach in terms of legislative affairs, and I, I know we have legislative um, staff members in Sacramento currently that work for the city. I think we should really be also looking at engaging them on this very issue in terms of where we can do this and not just rely on a correspondence. And so. I think right now as we have our discussion, I think we are at a point where we need to really kind of hone in where we want to go because we did make a commitment as far as this temporary use at the um, shelter on River Street to address the bench lens. And if we are to continue, we really have the council have to, you know, decide where, where we go and what direction. Um, without a partnership, um, we, I think we're, we, we can't continue. And so that's, that's really the question. I'd like to second that motion to-, to I can't make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I would like to move the motion that I could not possibly repeat everything that you just said, but I would like to um, make a motion that we do send a letter to the county asking for more clarification um, on their commitment to move forward. Um, and may I make a comment why I support that? You can do that, okay. you have the So floor. I make that motion. <laughs> uh, I don't know if someone would like to second it. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll put okay. it up there. And the reason I want to second it is we had a county supervisor, specifically John Leopold, send a letter that surprised everybody, um, you know, and sent a letter basically warning people about a plan that wasn't even a plan. Um, and that was really too bad um, because I think it, you know, it sent, a, it sent an alarm out that didn't need to be sent because it was something that, it, first of all, I just want to state that it was the county staff that came up with this location as an idea and it was communicated to city staff and neither staff was ready to even present this to us as a possibility, whether it was to the board of supervisors or to the city council. So to have a supervisor send that letter out was a bit shocking, I have to say. And I think it, it just, it scared people when it didn't need to scare people because we're not even at that point yet where that proposal was coming to us. So that's why I support the idea of a letter because what I'm finding and my experience is I'm seeing staff at county willing to think of new ideas and willing to maybe partner with us, but I'm not necessarily seeing a board of supervisors who's willing to do that. I'm seeing a couple supervisors, like I see Ryan Coonerty, who's been trying to work with us on this, um, but I'm not really hearing from the other members of the board to get clarity on whether we should continue having our staff spin their wheels and research these issues. So um, I second the motion and I just oh, wanted- you, you made the motion. Oh, I, I made the motion. It. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We've been meeting since uh, you know one, one o'clock today. So um, the other thing I just wanna mention, you know, somebody got up and said, it's simple, just put this in an industrial area. And I just want to say that it's not simple for staff because they have looked at industrial areas as a city, we don't have the power to just point out a piece of land and say, that's it, that's where we're putting our homeless shelter. Um, there's property rights. There's people who own the land. Um, the hey, just keep going, Michelle. Please, right. sir, there's can you please? Yeah, there's property, there's property rights involved. So someone who owns that, 
you know, we have to ask their permission to be able to be able to use that. And so I just wanna give kudos to the staff. They have looked at those possibilities. They have looked at industrial areas. The last thing they wanna do is propose something that, you know, is going to make a neighborhood unhappy. So I just wanna say they have tried and I want all of you to know that too. So, you know, we will go back to the drawing board. There are a couple of suggestions that people had that I think I saw them writing, you know, very, very much taking notes about those ideas. So they'll go back to that drawing board. But I, I really just wanna stress that, you know, we have thought of those possibilities and, you know, we found buildings that are empty, but if the owner isn't willing to lease the building to us, we can't use it. So um, just, just to know it isn't easy, unfortunately. I just wanna say that also, this is about the commitment in terms of funding and coordination to identify site. We're not even at the point of like identifying if there is a location. So I think that's the first issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but I do want to make sure that we know that we're looking at these recommendations here as well as the one to have a direct correspondence on the, the issue was from our, our county partners as well. Is that part of your motion? Yes, that is. Okay. <laughs> Council member Chase. Um, I, I appreciate the, the motion on the floor because I'm not gonna begin to speculate what exactly happened in this process um, between county and city staff working on this diligently for months and somehow it getting miscommunicated or not communicated to supervisors where we were in the process. So I, I think it's really important that we do get clarity from the elected officials so that we understand are we all moving forward uh, on the same page and in good faith to pursue this because I agree uh, with the mayor's point, which has been made many, many, many times, something like this cannot be done without collaboration. We don't have enough resources. We are clear that we need a shelter here. Uh, there's plenty of data to show that. Um, and this really, I think that we do have to understand who we're working with and what the rules are of agreement on this and how we uh, plan to proceed because absent that we are spinning our wheels. So I uh, will support the recommendation. I also wanna say, I absolutely appreciate that people are, are and I appreciate Councilmember Crone's question about do you have proposed solutions? Cause I think it is important that we uh, not just talk about our concerns, but always think about uh, what solutions we have and literally every solution and proposed site that's been suggested has had opposition. Uh, and so it is, uh, it is a fantasy to think that we are gonna find a site that doesn't. So we just have to be really clear that there's going to be opposition regardless of where the site is. And it's about us doing our due diligence to make sure that we create the safest uh, and most responsible place for that to be knowing we need a shelter. And just to clarify too, I, I, and just in terms of language, this is a universal we, this is a partnership and Absolutely. it's us as in terms of a regional solution. So when we talk about these things, it's hard because we're up here at the council and we've, we've been actually having several opportunities to have these discussions. And I, without any sort of clarity as far as whether or not there's agreement, I feel like it's important that we kind of maybe, you know, revert to getting a, that commitment to decide if we're gonna continue this discussion. And so when you say use the we, I, I assume that's what you meant. <laughs> Is there any other council member Crone? Um, thank you. I, 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 I wanted to say, uh, excuse me, um, send a letter also. I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm just a little bit, I was a little bit um, mildly uh, perturbed, quizzical. Um, why a camp? Someone said, why a camp? Why a homeless shelter? Um, because people need a place in, in their community. Um, these are our sons and our daughters and our mothers and our fathers who are homeless right now. And they are part of this community. And I think the council has realized this. And, and also I think if you go out, uh, I don't know if the person's still here, if you go out to the, the camp on River Street, you know, you can go in and you can see um, that it is well maintained and um, that it seems to be working out and it is a camp. Uh, and it is serving people, 50 to 60 people uh, each night. I wanted to, um, push back a little bit on Rochelle's comment about, um, uh, you know, what the, the perfect site finding, if, if we did find the perfect site, that if there is a crisis, a homeless crisis, there is a crisis in this community and we are looking for a homeless shelter. I just wanted to get a sense from the city attorney um, concerning eminent domain. If the perfect site was came up, can this council use eminent domain if it's in the public interest? 
yeah, there there is an eminent domain process that uh, could be utilized. It it is it can be a very um, lengthy process, but it starts with um, establishing public public necessity, as um, uh, Councilmember Crone was mentioning, um, and kind of the process is a resolution of public necessity, and there's several elements that would be required under the under the statutory scheme, including the project for which the property is to be acquired is deemed necessary, the property is considered necessary for the interests of the public, the project is located where it will offer the greatest public benefit with the least private detriment, and an offer to purchase the property has been made. And then as part of that, there's a, there's a process in terms of engaging with the property owner and, um, uh, going through an appraisal process and, and things like that. But that, that is um, an available avenue. And, and don't get me wrong, I think that we, you know, th this council would not just, you know, willy nilly um, be, be um, identifying properties and saying, oh, that's the one. Uh, and also in the eminent domain process, you always compensate people. It's not, a, it's not taking their property away without, you know, just compensation. It's usually 15% over the asking price as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments from council? I just have a brief question. Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you for the presentation and for the community members to come and speak in um, their opinions about this complex issue. I appreciate the comments um, that have been previously made by my colleagues up here in terms of clarity and expectation and helpful in terms of navigating how to move forward. I just wanted to um, make sure I had clarity on one of the slides, which was the budget funding model. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't um, mind going over sort of the concept and where we're at with that. Again, just to make sure I'm, I heard you correctly, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the, the high level concept is that the North County jurisdictions that are part of the HAP um, would be translating the winter shelter model to a year round shelter model. And there has been um, a great deal of um, progress on developing this proportionality. Um, it's based on population and that's um, has been the funding model for winter shelter for how long? Over decades. Yeah. And so the, the theory is as we translate from just winter shelter to a year round shelter, we would use that same proportionality. And that's what we have requested for consideration at the HAP. And did you say, if I can for clarity, excuse me, um, that you've had commitment from some of the jurisdictions or you have not at this point? So um, w when we met with HAP last week, it's obviously staff there. And as um, each jurisdiction goes through their budget process, the ultimate decision goes to the, those governing bodies. But what they did signal from a staff level is that there is you know, a priority around um, moving forward with year round shelter and that the cities in particular um, we're going to um, do their, their best to come up with the money. Um, obviously, that's a, a very small portion, Scotts Valley and Capitola of the, of the larger funding model. So they also signaled to the city and the county to come up with a recommendation and actually, you know, ensure much like you are suggesting that we're really clear on our partnership and then go back to them with the recommendation for funding from the cities. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'd just like to also kind of bring this point up and that, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, timelines as far as our kind of the emergency shelter that's on River Street. And um, the, the the language, and we'll have Rochelle restate the motion um, in a minute, but assuming, that what, what happens if there is no uh, commitment on this? What happens to the River Street shelter in terms of, you know, our funding? Do I mean, I even understand from the question, we don't have budget to continue beyond our current deadline. So, you know, do we, do you come up with a proposal in terms of how to wind that down? Yeah, so I think the, do you wanna go Martin? Yeah, I'll ask so Martin. I think Martin. He can add to it. So I think um, the intention for the next meeting is to provide those alternatives and based on what we understand from the county with, with the letter from the city council, um, we'll be able to make recommendations around a few alternatives and a wind down alternative is something that we'll have to consider on the 12th in, in, in addition to other alternatives if we do have some success with the county around siting as well as budget and other, you know, the program model as well. Mm -hmm. And then because it came up in terms of, even though we're not talking siting here, we're just looking at commitment first, would it be appropriate this time to talk a little bit about like some of the criteria that the staff is using to identify what locations um, you might consider? So I think that really is based on our 
our overall guiding principles with, with regard to the siting. Um, it's obviously a very complex issue as Co Council Member Noroyan and others talked about. Um, feasibility, um, there are many different aspects of the feasibility discussion. Um, and so we look at the feasibility um, predominantly around cost and whether it's even remotely possible to have a temporary um, camp at the site. Um, uh, neighborhood compatibility is part of that as well. Understanding the proximity of neighbors, um, looking at the current uses in that area, zoning and permitting. Um, there's many different layers in terms of feasibility and how we look at that, that criteria, but overarching um, concern is how do we, um, how do we find a, a location that we have some control around? And that's what really brought us to this question about publicly um, owned facilities. Okay, I guess w one of the points that came up um, was the idea of the, the proximity to schools. And, you, and I do think that's a factor that should weigh against a, lo a particular location. I just wanna make sure that, in, you know, in terms of how you look at it, that there's, you know, one, we wanna not have uh, facilities near a school or um, even some of the recreational facilities. We already see sometimes um, the impacts that have happened um, in certain parts of, of our um, city. Um, I know that there are also areas in a rural basis, maybe that are publicly owned outside of the city that should be considered. We've had some, um, you know, recommendations for, you know, within the city, but it'd be good to get a mix of different places mm -hmm. that are out there. I know the homeless, and I'll, I'll ask some of the people that were on the homeless mm -hmm. committee that looked at this, this was intended to be a regional one that's located, you know, th mid county is what was, I understood to be the recommendation that came out or, okay, well then you can clarify we that. Have a Never had a specific well, or, a, or a regional facility that was centrally regional. located, I think it was what the language was and, and no, okay, well then <laughs> maybe you could talk a little bit about how you talked about geographically, it's right. serving a geographic uh, group Right. Well, we've talked I, I wasn't on the committee, so I don't know, right. but well, I would we, like well, those that were on the committee the, to speak to that. Sure, what we've talked about with the, with the county in so far as phase three is to create these you know, navigation centers, and we've talked about having them spread throughout the county um, and you know, possibly having you know, three or so. Uh, Watsonville, you know, they also are in discussions. They're having similar issues as well. Again, this navigation model is a completely different model than what we've had thus far. Um, but the idea is to have regional models uh, and uh, not just in the city, but you know, perhaps you know, North County, Mid County, and South County were, were the discussions. And in this particular case, the other thing that's important to just recognize is that uh, the reason why we're looking for an interim facility is because with respect to our North County facility, we have identified a site and we are in the process of uh, acquiring, you know, doing the appraisal and, and, and with the property acquisition, because ultimately what we want to do is to move into an appropriate facility, which would be a building, not necessarily an encampment. So these are just interim measures to get us to that. And we are making progress on the more permanent solution, uh, but that's gonna take a bit of time. And uh, to just to address the, the proximity to the school issue, this did come up when we were talking about the armory and um, the superintendent of the Santa Cruz City Schools District did send a letter to the neighbors that were concerned about the armory, suggesting that she didn't have concern about proximity to schools. And I'm not suggesting that would be the opinion of the council, but also wanted to be really clear that this type of shelter would serve families and families in the school district as well. And just for, for you know all those that are considering this to take that into consideration as well. So I, I think we'd want to you know coordinate and collaborate with the school districts and um, both the COE and the Santa Cruz City School Districts around siting as well. Yeah, well, we've actually experienced at the River Street Camp is actually that security and safety has actually improved around, around the shelter um, because the, there's just 24 hour security uh, in the facility and around the facility. So it's actually improved conditions. Uh, I'd like, I mean, for, I know I had one of the subcommittee members that isn't on the, the homeless committee that co commented about the direction that came up. And I just was curious, you know, is this consistent with the, the recommendations from the homeless subcommittee in terms of what we're doing now? In regard to what? The phase two discussion that we're at on the, on the agenda right now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, should I go ahead and repeat the? No, I was just oh. want to make sure that confirming that we're being consistent with the recommendations of the homeless subcommittee. I would say we are. I mean, we didn't necessarily um, see this in phases like we're doing because we wanted, to, you know, we wanted to institute it more quickly because, you know, as days went on, just the amount of homeless people we're seeing just has been increasing rapidly, and so 
um, we felt we needed to, I guess, as a council, increase our, our um, timeline. And then the geographic location that came up in terms of having multiple locations. It, it in the did. County. No, it definitely did come up. Um, it wasn't the absolute requirement, but you know, I mean, some people think the ideal would be to have a shelter, say, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, a shelter in Mid County, something in the city. So, uh, you know, Watsonville already has shelters. So, um, you know, and I just wanted to mention. Somebody said, "Well, why do we need these shelters?" I mean, what we find is when people get stabilized and go into them, all of those calls for service that they were causing for ambulance calls, for police calls. The same police officer sometimes would have contact with the same homeless person three times in one evening because the homeless person's trying to find a place to sleep and each time a call comes to ask the homeless person to leave. And so there are some real pragmatic reasons for doing this. There's a humanitarian reason. And also there are cities who no longer can enforce um, any of their ordinances related to people who are homeless, you know, uh, camping out um, and doing other activities <laughs> because the courts are now saying if you don't have a place for folks to go, you can't enforce these ordinances. And so we didn't want to get to a point either where we weren't able to enforce our own ordinances because we didn't have a place for, for people to go. So there's pragmatic reasons and there's humanitarian reasons for us to come to the conclusions that we did. <laughs> and I'll say too that uh, while we didn't come up with specific locations, we did absolutely recommend a regional approach, that this would yeah. not be something that would be the responsibility of any specific jurisdiction, but actually all the jurisdictions really needed to come to the table on this if we were going to have a solution because it's not a, a jurisdictional issue. It's at least a regional issue. And as we know by the numbers, it's clearly a state issue and in many cases a national issue. I guess w looking at the way that this is unfolding, we have one in the incorporated Watsonville area, one in the, uh, that's you know being led by you know basically you know our staff has been investigating the the city one. I think I, it would, I think this kind of direction is really kind of see where we are going to move forward to see what our next steps are. So I um, I would like to ask at this point to have the motion restated. Okay. So in addition to the next step recommendations that are up on the screen right now. Um, the council authorizes the mayor to draft a correspondence to our county partners to confirm their support for increasing emergency shelter capacity on a year round basis as outlined by staff and requesting their support, support both with respect to contributing um, a fair share of funding and to collaborate and make a recommendation with respect to the site evaluation and decision making response, uh, decision making process, excuse me, and uh, with a response by mid June so that city staff can formulate decisions about the fate of the River Street Camp. And I'll hand this to you. Is that clear? I'll hand this to okay. you. Yeah. Um, just one point of clarification. It would be nice to get the letter back before the council meeting on June 12th. Uh -oh. So do you want me to cite a specific date, June 11th? No, we, we need to June do an agenda yeah. Thursday, report. maybe the Wednesday before. You give me a June. date, no. Yes. Um, it's hard to give direction June 6th on that, else's or June 7th. Requesting a response by <laughs> June 6th. Okay. That's optimistic, but we can try. Um, I have a question for the maker of the motion. Uh, the, the language around fair share is pretty subjective. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might want to consider <laughs> their share is related yeah. to what was say just their no, share. No, yeah, just whatever. Th I mean, I, I'm just suggesting that I think we're share. all going to have different opinions, including the other members. So do you have <laughs> a suggestion body. for something else um, other than that? So, I mean, uh, did you want to contribute? Yeah, I mean, I think what we would recommend is that we that we use the you know the winter shelter funding formula that we've been using. It's it's been well established for for many 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 years. And which, so are we yeah. seeking an agreement? on the specific recommendation for the HAP breakdown of funding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and recognizing that, you know, uh, I guess we all have constraints too. So I think, you know, if we have a, a fair formula that we all agree on, we can certainly work on the, on the cost side of it and also mm -hmm. on uh, identifying additional funding as well. So it's, it's not like we're forcing everybody to come up with sort of a fixed dollar amount. So and they may not necessarily be able to, uh, 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 afford, but uh, if we can get a commitment towards uh, using a formula that's fair, that's established, and then one, and then secondarily to 
uh, recognizing that we'll have to uh, provide additional funding. Okay, so just a suggestion. So maybe to say um, there's support both with respect to funding and just say to funding as opposed to saying to fair share or formula funding or blah, blah. okay. Yeah, it's fair share funding as described in our guiding principles. So you wanna keep it, okay. <laughs> and we'll, we'll craft it in the letter. You know, when we do the letter, we'll craft okay. it. We'll okay, I'll, all right, I'm open to. And I, uh, it's a detail and you can take care of it in the editing, but this is just going to supervisors, correct? Correct. So we can't commit them to what Scotts Valley and Capitola are gonna do, but I, I think we can just say, mm -hmm. um, uh, generally assumed on the existing HAP formula for division of cost or something like that. And just because- In a letter maybe as opposed to the motion? Can, okay, all right. And because without that commitment, nothing moves forward. Right, yeah, yep. so I just wanna- and, uh, I, I also, I haven't been a part, in, uh, direct part of these conversations. My understanding is informal conversations with the various jurisdictions uh, are headed in this direction. So this isn't gonna come. Okay, and then the other piece was um, once we get a response, you will also know by June 12th, you'll give recommendations on um, either way what the status is of the, the emergency River Street shelter in terms of that impact. Yeah. Is it appropriate to say if there is, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, is there um, any other discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That passes unanimously. All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, we're not done. More appreciation if you want. <laughs> okay, so the next item is number 13, and that's the meeting calendar. Anything uh, for the meeting calendar to report? No? It's up to we date. have, um, yeah, our, they'll ask, uh, City Manager Bernal? Yeah, no, no, I think it's it's up to date. Yeah, What's that? <laughs> it's up to date, the calendar. Okay, yeah, the calendar. So no up changes. Date. Okay. Um, and then there's also a kind of an update from Marcus Pimentel regarding the budget that has some background. There's gonna be a public meeting May 31st. That's not on our agenda that, uh, <coughs> regarding the budget. And okay, so moving on, um, we have not um, covered oral communications yet. Is there any member of the public here to speak to oral communications? Okay. Any member, I'm gonna wait just a little bit, <laughs> couple of minutes, Believe it. maybe 60 <laughs> seconds. Any member of the public that, that would like to speak to oral communications? Going on. This is, a time for you, this is a time for any member of the public who would like to speak to any item that's not on today's agenda. Yeah, mm. thanks, I'm glad, <laughs> glad you asked the question. No problem, you have. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your patience too. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am uh, Heather Sawyer. I'm the chair for the City's Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, and I'm here on behalf of the EEOC to request um, City Council to submit a letter supporting the adoption of North America's Urban Libraries Council's Statement of Commitment to Racial and Social Equity. Um, the, uh, City's Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, EEOC, was established in 1986 to support an effective aff affirmative action program. Its current mission is to confirm the city's commitment to maintaining a work environment free from unlawful discrimination and harassment for all current and prospective city employees. <laughs> the Santa Cruz Public Libraries is currently contemplating adopting the Urban Libraries Council statement of commitment to racial and social equity. If it's okay with you, I'd like to read that. Um, can you start the time? Yeah, yeah, you, you can fin finish it if you can. You okay. Get, you had some time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the North American Urban Libraries Council's statement of commitment to racial and social equity serves as a baseline upon which Santa Cruz Public Libraries will build policies and actions that make the communities serve more inclusive and just. The statement reads as follows. As leaders of North America's public libraries, we are committed to achieving racial and social equity by contributing to a more just society in which all community members can realize their full potential. 
Our libraries can help achieve true and sustained equity through an intentional, systemic, and transformative library community partnership. Our library systems are working to achieve equity in the communities served by eliminating racial and social equity barriers in library programs, services, policies, and practices, creating and maintaining an environment of diversity, inclusion, and respect both in our library systems and in all aspects of our community role, ensuring that we are reaching and engaging disenfranchised people in the community and helping them express their voice, serving as a convener and facilitator of conversations and partnerships to address community challenges, being forthright on tough issues that are important to our communities. Libraries are trusted, venerable, and enduring institutions central to their communities and an essential participant in the movement for racial and social equity. So the EEOC has reviewed the statement, and in this time of political and social divisiveness, the EEOC strongly supports the intent expressed in the statement and requests that the City Council submit to the Library Board a letter in support of the adoption of the statement. Um, the reason why I'm here is because um, this just came up at last week's um, committee meeting and it's possibly going to the June 7th Library um, Joint Powers Board, um, tentatively, so tentatively June 7th or August 2nd, so we want it to come forward now. Absolutely. Hey, I, um, I wanted just to ask you, um, or maybe I'll ask our board member for the Library Board, um, City Manager Bernal. How did this come up where the, the board was contemplating putting this on their agenda for um, action? This, this particular item? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar with it. I haven't really gotten any so, correspondence with um, it. So we had our regular EEOC committee meeting last week. Um, Amy Sherman, who is the vice chair, is also a librarian and brought this forward. And this was an item that we thought um, they requested that I come forward and present this on behalf of the committee or the EEOC committee to ask for. So, I don't but think I guess did the EEOC put put this on the a library board agenda? No, or? this this is something that just falls in line with what the committee. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it hasn't I, been to the library board, right? Okay, yeah, I, I mean I support it, and if, we, if I guess it's not enough time to put it on the agenda, but I mean if everyone's, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll work that, with Heather. Yeah, to, that was going to be if I could. That was going to be my point. We can't take action now because exactly. it's not on the agenda. Um, I'll personally write a letter of support. I, I think that would make sense. And um, all of this is very much reflected in the kind of initiatives our library has already undertaken mm -hmm. in so many ways. So I think it's yeah. kind of consistent with our library practice, our library system practice, but we can't yeah. authorize something. Yes, and I understand that. We just thought we would. Maybe. Yeah, something. I'll get a letter out um, before the library deadline, make oh. sure that the city manager gets it. <laughs> okay, so that closes um, our oral communications. We have one more item um, here on our open session, and that is um, uh, provide um, opportunities for council members and the city manager to report on actions or external boards or committees um, that occurred since the last city council meeting. I'll start, yeah, I'll go, uh, Council Member Crown, do you have anything? Come back to me. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. You could do LRDP. Um, I just want to mention a few events. They weren't really committee assignments, but uh, several of us were at the Guela Greatza. Um, Guela Greatza. Yeah, um, event, which was fantastic. And I've never seen San Lorenzo Park as full and just Do incredible for any event ever. It was wonderful. And the city of Santa Cruz was a sponsor of this and got fully recognized and very much appreciated. Um, then there's also at the Museum of Natural History, the Art of Nature is a wonderful exhibit. That's a, uh, I think you know the museum proper is the property of the city. Um, the museum um, uh, association runs it, but a really, if you haven't gone to this uh, in the past, it's a wonderful exhibit. And then um, on the, I'm a representative to the League of California Cities Regional Division, and we had a meeting on Monday, uh, last Monday evening, and top of mind for everyone was defending SB1 for all the representatives from all the cities in our region. And the, the uh, uh, topic was, how are the many, many, many different ways that we can let the public know the benefits of SB1? I think Mark mentioned it in his comments about 
something in Public Works Week, or <laughs> that, uh, just trying to say, this is made possible by SB1. Um, so Metro is having an event uh, uh, on Thursday, May 31st in the morning, 10 to 11, at Pacific Station, and it's going to be celebrating the bus and paratransit vehicle purchases made possible by SB1 and Measure D. And those of you who are familiar with the Metro system know that they, they're due for about 60 new buses that are past their useful lifetime, but uh, we were able to buy a few because of SB1 and Measure D. So they wanna promote that and again, just raise the vis visibility because as you know, that's at risk of repeal in the fall. So um, again, uh, that's uh, Thursday, May 31st, 10 to 11 at Pacific Station, promoting the benefits of SB1. You ready, Chris, or do you want me to keep going? Uh, keep I'm going. Ready. Okay, Council Member Chase. Um, so I want to report out on the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee. We had a really, really well attended mm -hmm. event at Loudon Nelson. There was over 200 people, some faces that we've seen many times before, but a lot of faces that we haven't, and really incredible um, activities, interactive presentations that were set up by staff and was a very, very successful event. We got a lot of great feedback and a lot of surprising information that we received from folks and then a lot of things that have confirmed things that we've been hearing uh, for a while. So I just wanted to highlight what a great event that was and that I think it accomplished what we were trying to do. Um, I don't think I have any other things to update on. Nope, that's it. Council Member Brown. Oh. I actually uh, don't have anything to report related to any of the interagency boards and commissions and JPAs that I serve on uh, right now. Um, but I did want to say that um, Councilmember Matthews and I went and had a wonderful time trying to listen to a band in Alushta, um, Crimea, <laughs> one of our sister so cool. cities. And um, we had a great time. And, um, you know, despite some technological challenges, we. Um, we got to communicate across a considerable distance, so that was really awesome. And I also want to say happy birthday to Isabella Maria Terrazas. <laughs> oh, I know, that was cute. <laughs> oh, so um, unfortunately I was sick a lot the last couple of weeks, but I did manage to um, uh, see the housing fair up at UC Santa Cruz. So every year my interns with my um, UC Santa Cruz position um, partner up with many city um, agencies to host a housing fair up on campus for students who are planning on moving, um, who are living on campus, moving off campus and trying to make their experience as smooth as possible. We have property managers, they can talk one on one with them, but we also had our fire department, we had waste management and code enforcement up there as well. So students can know what to do. You know, for instance, a student that approached me a couple years ago and said, we have a hole in our living room. What should we do? So I, that was kind of the, the impetus to have me ask code enforcement to be part of the housing fair. And they've been there the last few years. Waste management explained to students about the need to order a cart that's actually big enough for their garbage, because that's an issue that comes up a lot during the year. So. It was um, really successful. A lot of students were able to make it, and um, it's the fifth year in a row that we've held this, and we get really good feedback from students that it's really helpful. So um, maybe in uh, next year, I'll remember to let all of you know ahead of time if any of you want to drop by for it. Do I have anything? I'll bring up one thing before we turn it over to. Uh, uh, do you want to go first? I'm just gonna go real brief. We have our ad hoc budget committee. It's uh, com uh, consists of Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself. And I tell you, it's been a really, um, a really engaging and educational experience working with um, the um, finance director, Mark and Marcus Pimentel, and, and his staff. He's really been uh, really supportive about increasing our outreach and engagement with the public. We, um, we have a coordinated campaign and we've identified lots of different opportunities to reach out leading up to our June 6 budget. So I wanted to also mention that on May 31st, there's gonna be a public meeting at, I believe the police community room. Um, and there's a flyer for that to uh, provide, um, you know, a budget presenta presentation and answer questions. We'll also be gathering questions as we go along from community members that we've had contacts with. And um, I think it's, uh, going to be a different budget process this year. We're going to have a one-day budget hearing on June 6th, and I think that um, there was a memo that was left at your table from Marcus that kind of outlined some of those things, but I just want to express appreciation for working with the uh, committee members. I think it's been going really well. 
That's what's oh, just, just to fill it out, just fin finish. Um, yeah, the LRDP committee um, has not met since our last council meeting, as far as I know. Uh, we are meeting this week, uh, Thursday, and uh, I'm kind of excited because I put a item on the agenda, uh, but that uh, this agenda item won't be taken up until June meeting, but I posed the question, um, it, how can we get to 19,500? How can we get, have everybody save face and you know do a team approach here, city working with the university and going to Sacramento or whatever it takes to get to that 19,500? Can they contemplate that? Can they think that that would be an okay thing? The other thing I wanted to alert there the- There was a limit on that. What's that? 19,500 and no more. And Well, and no more, yes, <laughs> and no more. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> um, and the Measure 69 is right now before the students. They started voting last Thursday. And Measure 69 is a really significant issue concerning transportation, the loop bus, the metro bus, what the students pay into the system. Right now, um, it's so funny. It's like in 2000, they were paying 350. Uh, Matt Miller, I saw him today at the jump bike thing, and he graduated a few years ago, and he said it was 750. He remembers per quarter. Right now, it's 111 dollars per quarter per student. They're asking the students to pay about 192 to 200 by 2022. It's become a big issue on campus. Uh, it, there wasn't much talk about it before it came up, and I was concerned about that. So I'm, I'm very concerned. A, if it's going to pass. B. Um, if students know what they're getting from their transportation monies, there really hasn't been what I would call a robust debate around on, on campus about this issue. But um, I'm holding my breath to see where it shakes out. I have a feeling that we might be disappointed in them not supporting it uh, because it's either not widespread enough or because there's um, active opposition on campus. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Martin. So um, we held a uh, 911 center board meeting since our last council meeting and uh, did a couple of things, approved the budget, uh, which includes uh, about a 7% increase uh, to the member agencies, including the city. Um, we uh, updated our sexual harassment policy and also heard from the uh, auditor uh, who did a, the, the annual audit and gave the agency a clean report. Uh, we also had a meeting of the operations board of the Monterey Bay Power and noteworthy items were uh, the approval of a request for offers for a local renewable generation and energy storage project. Um, and that's uh, uh, really interesting because we might have some project at the city uh, that might be eligible for some of that funding, including some of our solar projects and some energy storage projects that we're looking at trying to create uh, here in the city. Uh, and then finally, uh, one of the other things that was interesting about the meeting is we agreed, the operations board agreed to uh, to hold remote meetings where we, through Skype uh, here at the city of Santa Cruz, we can have members of the public uh, attend uh, in a conference room and be involved with the meetings and also because it's such a large area uh, and in the meetings, it takes like an hour just to get to the offices uh, and then an hour to get back. Uh, and so the board agreed to try to have these remote meetings to, for the convenience of the board members as well as the public. So it's, they're gonna try it to see if we can have these remote Skype meetings. You mean, you mean the board members and the public would participate remotely or the board members? Yes, yeah, so like Santa Cruz member agencies could could be here in Santa Cruz uh, via Spike, uh, Skype and then and, and members of the public and it'd be with video feed kind of a meeting. Are there any agencies that do that? Um, you know, I'm not sure if I know if there are any. I'm curious, uh, I assume so, yeah. But Council there member. should be. I mean, all these meetings, you drive all the way to Monterey for whatever no, meeting. No, I'm just curious. Yeah, it, it, it was really a... All the time. You know, and, and the people yeah. in, from San Benito County right. and all of the other places that people are coming from, you know, we all just show up and think, wow. So um, it's great to hear that you're doing that. Um, yeah, I decided to try it, you know, at least at least to try it and see, see if it works okay. out and see if it can no, be no, successful, no. so. No, I didn't we might even we televise planning commission meetings sometime and be a model. Thank you. Well, you know, we do have one uh, more item to recess to for closed session. So we're going to go back to do that, and then we'll adjourn the meeting from there. Okay, so thank you. Um, we'll uh, uh, leave this portion of the meeting and finish.